Good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, this is fantastic for me to be here. Um, a few years ago, I wrote a book called When Digital Becomes Human. And then coming all the way from Europe to, to India to see that this is the theme of a conference is really uh, fantastic. So thank you very much for that. I'm very proud that I can bring you this, this story and hope that you will like it. Uh, th this is a story not about technology. This is a story about how customer expectations are changing and how we can become customer-centric in a digital world. And, and you know, many companies today have this question, how can we become customer-centric in a world of automation? And, and for me, the essence of the whole thing is, is really very basic, actually. I think this is the future of customer experience summarized on one slide, that we figure out ways how we can use technology to automate as many processes as possible. And because of that, the humans can lay a sort of emotional layer on top of that relationship with customers. Um, but before I dive into the details, I just want to tell you how I came to this idea of this, of this talk. And it has a lot to do with our family. My, I have two children, and um, they're seven and nine, two boys, a lovely wife, and we're a big fan of robots in our house. We have a lot of robots, and this is actually our favorite robot in our house. Uh, a vacuum cleaning robot, we're a huge fan of it. It helps us to you know, clean up the kitchen after our children had breakfast, but it also helps us to raise the children. So th I will tell you a trick, huh? this, is, this is how we do it. I push that clean button in the middle of that robot and then my children hear a sound effect. It goes like this, like doo doo. So the children hear doo doo. And then they look at me and then they say, Dad, you didn't release the robot. And then I said, yeah, I just released the robot. And then they say, but our toys, our Legos are still on the floor. And then I tell them, I know, you have 30 seconds left. And then they start to clean like crazy. Uh, so for us, this is a fantastic mechanism. We do doo doo and boom, they start to clean. And I can tell you it works perfectly. But after a while, as a young parent, you suddenly realize that that machine has more authority over your children than you do as a human. And that is a difficult moment in your life as a young parent. So my wife and me, we had a brainstorm about that. And we decided to <clears throat> mentally get over it. Huh? And we decided to, to raise our children with the three of us, the two humans plus the robot. And for us, it works really fine. We discovered that man and machine are stronger than man alone. And you know, even if your children are still really young, you can still get a robot like that because they will enjoy it in a different way. Um, but our family is a huge fan of it. And it brought me to that essence that the goal is, as a company, to combine those strengths of digital to make sure you can automate many processes. And because of that, you can put a layer on top of that that becomes more emotional, which is the key, uh, let's say, benefit that we can add as humans. Now, if you look at the, the history of management, in, in the past, in business schools, what they taught us is that we had to make a choice, that we had to choose between operational excellence, being very efficient, or customer intimacy. And what you see more and more today is that smart companies actually combine the two. And they use smart technologies to become very efficient. And on the other hand, they use humans to be very emotionally engaged with customers and combine the strengths of those two. Um, this here is, is one of my favorite examples. It's a company called Citizen M. It's a new style hotel chain that we have in, uh, in Europe and the US, and it's very strange. Uh, it's not like this hotel. I mean, here we have beautiful big rooms. There, uh, Citizen M, it's probably the smallest hotel room you have ever seen on the planet. And if you check in, it's not like here that friendly people are welcoming you. It's a fully automated system. And you know, the traditional hotel industry, they thought that this was an awful system because they said, you know, if you go to a hotel, there should be people welcoming you. I mean, it's, it's the hospitality business. These guys are saying, no, 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 we disagree because, you know, if you go to a hotel, in a business hotel, and you check in, usually the first thing they give you is like a piece of paper, and then you have to fill out your address and all the information, which they already have because you made the booking online. That's like a sad moment in your customer experience. And then you have to hand over that paper to that friendly man or woman that is there for you, and they have to type in that information in a computer system that may be from the previous century. Um, no added value in the relationship, just an awkward moment that is wasting time of customers. So at Citizen M, they're saying we're gonna fully automate the check-in to make sure that people can get their room key as fast as possible. We don't invest in humans in that part of the relationship. However, 
they decided to invest in humans in what they feel is the most important part of the hotel. I don't know what you think in India is the most important part of a hotel. In Belgium, where I come from, we feel the most important part of the hotel is the bar, uh, the hotel bar. Um, but the truth is, in many hotels, I go to a lot of hotels all over the world, and in many hotels, the, the hotel bar is like the saddest place on the planet, uh, the most lonely place on the planet. Not at Citizen M, because they invested in humans that love to work there. They're having the time of their life. They're making cocktails like true showmen. And, you know, the rooms are so small that everyone is in that bar. Uh, and the good thing about the bar is it's also open 24-7 because they believe if you arrive at 2 a.m. in the morning in a hotel that you should be able to get a beer if you feel like having a beer. And it's fantastic. Uh, good food, good drinks, very cheap, great Wi-Fi. And they invest in humans there. So, you know, th this hotel group has lovers and haters. Some people love it. Some people think it's awful. But what I find really intriguing is the exercise that they've done. They looked at all the interactions they have with customers, and then they started to define in which of those interactions do humans add value, and if they do, let's invest more in humans, and in which interactions humans do not add value, well, let's invest more in technology in those, and let's combine those two. Now, I don't know if you have seen this film. This is, um, How was the first you can put the sound a little bit more silent. This is one of my favorite Disney films. It's called Inside Out, and it shows you how our brain works, seen from the eyes of a teenage girl. If you haven't seen it, this is your homework for after the conference. Huh? Um, because this video shows you how our brain works, how our emotions are programmed, and then you will see that it's not programmed in a really good way. Because we have five emotions, only one positive one, joy. Then we have sadness, we have anger, we have disgust, and we have fear. So we have five emotions and four of them are negative. That is why customers complain so much. Huh? They cannot help it. They were programmed in a wrong way. But if you know this and you know that, you can actually combine those two. So for me, this is the summary of customer experience in a digital world where we have to figure out as organizations and as a society to create the best possible digital interfaces the world has ever seen. And if you succeed in that, you can actually neutralize a lot of the negative emotions. And if you do a good job, well, then the humans can put an additional emotional layer on top of that. And it's that combination that really works well. I meet a lot of companies that tell me, oh, we've got the humans. We'll do technology later. But that doesn't work anymore because, because if you don't have technology, the humans have to neutralize the negative emotions. And the customer doesn't give you the time and the space anymore to add emotions on top of that. So the challenge is how to combine that. As you will notice throughout this presentation, I'm a huge Disney fan. And if you go to Disney World, um, one of the really impressive projects that they installed in the last few years are the magic bands. Uh, so if you go to Disney World in Florida, in US, every member of the family that goes there gets, uh, gets a magic band, uh, which is great because that band actually does everything for you. It opens up your hotel room. It gives you access to the parks. It allows you to pay. Uh, you just have to hold the bracelet against the Mickey sensor and pots, you've paid. And I can tell you, for someone like me, this is extremely dangerous. I walk around there like this, like <laughs> buying stuff all the time. And then five days later, you get the check. Huh? And then it feels really impressive to look at your own behavior. And I thought it was, I thought it was just me, because I'm an easy victim for all of this. But, you know, I was very happy when I saw the annual report of Disney that had this as headline. It says, the magic bands are magic money makers. It wasn't just me that spent more money. The truth is that people with that bracelet, uh, and Accenture was part of that, uh, of that project, the, the truth is with that bra people with that bracelet spend 30% more money than people without it. Uh, if you make it fast, easy, and fun for people to spend money with your organization, there's a big chance that they will actually do it. Uh, but the best part is the overall integration between on and offline. So I'm a huge fan of the, of the app. You know, you walk around in Disney World and you make reservations for the, for the rides. You go on the rides with your app. And in some of the restaurants, they've installed sensors now so they can virtually see you coming. So you made a reservation. You walk up to the door of that restaurant. The door opens up. And they're saying, hey, Steven, we were expecting you. We, we, we saw you coming, and we know you're a family of four, two young children. Please follow us to your table. Versus 
Do you have a reservation? What's your last name? Me saying Van Bellegem. Huh? That's a big hit in other countries. So then it's always an awkward moment to find me on that list. You can imagine that. Now they take, a, take out that annoying process by automation. And the cool thing is me as a guest, I don't have the feeling that it's technology that's doing a good job. I have the feeling that the humans are doing a good job. Why? Because Disney is facilitating their humans with smart technologies to do a better job, a more personalized job, and combining those strengths of digital and human. And that works really, really well for them. But now, I think you feel this as well in, in your day-to-day -day practice, if you read everything in the press about technology, we're moving into this new phase of digital. And in my opinion, what 2007 was for mobile was 2017 for artificial intelligence. Uh, we're, we're at the beginning of a new S-curve. Like in 2007, when the iPhone came out, it was the beginning of a new S-curve, the S-curve of mobile which changed societies, which changed our day-to-day -day behavior. I mean, if I look back to 2007, nobody expected how important mobile phones would be today. I think we're at the same point now for artificial intelligence. I, I don't know if you've seen this. This is the trailer of the new Lion King film that came out last weekend. And the top trailer is the trailer from 1994, so 24 years ago. The bottom one is for the movie that will come out next summer. This for me is just in one blink of an eye, you can see how technology evolved in the last 25 years. If we would have seen those below images 10 years ago, we would have thought, wow, that is fantastic how they can film nature in, in action. And it's fully computer generated. So you feel how we're becoming part of this new S-curve and it's, it's really fascinating. But my worry is that, you know, at the end of the day, that we become overexcited about technology. And technology is really cool, but I think we shouldn't get overexcited about it. I think we should keep our focus on customers and, and creating customer benefits and, and figuring out how we can really create value for them. Um, I have the pleasure of spending quite some time with big technology companies. Uh, I spend quite some time with Google every year. And every time I go there, this is one of the slides that they present. And this is my favorite slide at Google because it goes further in customer experience than what a lot of companies do. Uh, if people cannot write, it's our problem. If they don't speak the language, it's our problem. If the internet is too slow, it's our problem. They don't blame it on the customer. They figure out a way how to solve it. And I meet many companies that tell me that they are extremely customer focused but it's like the man here on the right that tells his wife when he comes back from his job that he saved the planet, huh? that he's completely convinced that he's doing an outstanding job in terms of security there. Um, I meet a lot of companies that tell me we're completely customer centric and then you look at their scores and they have negative customer satisfaction scores. So the, the challenge is to avoid that and, and there's still room for improvement. This is one of my favorite examples, huh? United Airlines. I'm a huge fan of United Airlines, but I never fly with them. Um, I fly about 150 times a year, but never with United. But I'm a big fan because every year they do funny stuff that I can use in my presentations. Uh, and I would like to thank them for that and encourage them to continue to do so. Uh. So <laughs> a few months ago, this was one of their moments of glory. So there was a passenger sitting on the wrong seat of the plane, and in their own United Airlines style, they asked that passenger to leave that seat. Huh? You can see that happening right here. Now, you have to know the marketing slogan of United is, we are the friendly smile in the sky. Huh? This is the friendly smile in the sky in real life. So there's a gap. Huh? There's a gap between marketing and uh, reality. Now, what you need to do on a day like this is go to social media to see how customers think about this. Because then customers say, a smile in the sky, that's not the best thing. Let's invent some new slogans for these guys. And then they come up with things like this. United actually means we treat you like we treat your luggage. Huh? That's a good alternative. Or this one here, not enough seating, prepare for a beating. But my favorite one is this one. If you cannot beat your competitor, you beat your customer. Huh? So thank God for United Airlines, just don't fly with them. But they don't think like this. You know, if you look at the innovations of Google, they're trying to solve every single one of these issues with innovations. And because of that, we thank them every single day. Uh, and it's, it's a challenge to keep your eye on that customer. And I, I think one of the challenges for, for all of us is to get 
out of our bubble, you know. Every single one of you in the room, me, we all live on our own little bubble, the bubble of our society, the bubble of our company, maybe the office in our company. And, you know, I had the, the pleasure a few weeks ago to, to meet with President Obama when he was in Europe. And um, this is one of the things that he, that he talked about. He said, the White House is probably the biggest bubble on the planet. Uh, if you are president of the United States, there's probably no other position where you're further away from day-to-day -day reality. So he, did, he tried to get out of that bubble. And one of the things that he did, and I was impressed with that, it's, it's simple, but I think it's effective, that was every night before he went to bed, he read 10 letters of U.S. citizens. And, you know, this was his final homework. And he, he was talking about this, and he said, you know, as a president of America, you, you do your homework, and you start with all the issues. And point one is maybe the war in Afghanistan, and it's solving an, an economical crisis. And then you read a letter of someone that lives in Arizona that doesn't have enough money with their pension to buy food at the end of the month. And then he says, everything I've been working on is basically of zero relevance for a lot of the citizens in my country, which are my customers. So it's a challenge for all of us to get out of that bubble and to, to see things and to understand how markets are evolving. You know, and, and the things sometimes that we see at home, also take them to our companies and implement them. I was recently visiting Twitch, and Twitch is the largest eSports community of the world. So basically what, what happens is that people play games, Usually young people, they play games. Fortnite is now the most popular game. And then they start streaming that on platforms, and Twitch is the largest one in the world. And then when they start, other people can watch them play those games. Like for me, I don't know about you, I, I, I don't know your market well enough, but for me, my children, they like to play games. But my youngest son, he spends more time watching other children playing games than he is actually playing. For me, that was totally weird. But for them, it's like the most normal thing in the world. Uh, this, this guy is called Ninja, that's his code name on Twitch. Ninja, he's the most popular gamer in the world right now. So if he starts to play, instantly between 75 and 100,000 people start watching him when he's playing. And this guy is now making $500,000 a month by playing computer games and other people are watching that. Why am I telling this? Because these are communities that are significant, that are large that a lot of business people of, let's say, our age here in the group isn't familiar with, isn't aware of, or we are aware of it, but we don't think about it. And I think our challenge is to get out of that bubble to see all these evolutions and understand what it could mean and see if we can learn from that to make sure we can bring value to customers. Huh? And, you know, my, my favorite quote of Larry Page is this one. Why do toasters still burn toast? We can do everything on this planet. We have people in outer space, but making a toaster that does not burn toast is extremely hard. And make no mistake, we have smart toasters now on the planet. And you know what this does? It sends you a text message the moment that your toast is ready. In case you have forgotten what happened with that bread in those 30 seconds that it's in that machine. I mean, and, and still, you get burned toast. So nobody is waiting for this. This is what I call the internet of stupid things. We make it because technology allows us to do, but nobody is waiting for that. Huh? Why do we have toasters that burn toast? It's bringing no relevance for customers. Huh? And, and the challenge is figuring out what can we do that brings value to customers. I was recently speaking in Canada, and I met with this guy here on the left. His name is Fred, and he is the founder of what is now the fastest growing travel app in the world, and it's called Hopper. And what they do is simple but brilliant. They give you the opportunity to book flights through their app. But in 75% of the cases, they will say, this is not a good time to buy this ticket. And what these guys do is they've been monitoring the evolution of price curves of airlines for 10 years. And I, now they have an algorithm that can predict when it's going to be the lowest price to buy. So if you work together with them, they will send you a push notification saying this is a good moment to buy. And you're going to save 10 to 15% on that ticket. Of course, this is value where everyone is waiting for because everyone knows that airlines are playing with prices. We just don't know how. These guys figured it out and they're facilitating us with that. That is uh, fantastic. And that's part of that flip from 
mobile first to AI first. But I do believe the complexity is, is increasing. I believe the complexity of competing is increasing. This is what I've been taught in marketing classes 20 years ago. They told me if you want to win in business, you have to make sure that you're really good in one thing and be average in all the others. So if you want to win, make sure you have the best service or that you're the cheapest one or that you have the most beautiful store. I think this doesn't apply anymore because that bar of customer expectations, bam, it went all the way up. So if you want to win in today's highly competitive markets, this is how you play. Basically, every touch point, every interaction has to be good. And then hopefully you have a few that even stand out. And this is the end of, of the USP. Uh, this is what I've been trained in, in marketing back in the days, a unique selling proposition. I don't think this exists anymore. And this is the big paradox of phase three of digital, that the complexity for organizations is increasing. And at the same time, the level of interaction with customers should be easier than ever before. Think about this. What, it, what is in today's world the scarcest resource people have? For a lot of people, Time has become the scarcest resource. If you agree with that, then the question is, how focused are you on saving out time of your customers? How focused are you on creating the ultimate convenience? Uh, look, we, we all know that you know, these big technology companies from Silicon Valley, they did pretty well on the stock market, right? We were all not in the last two weeks, but before that, they did a pretty good job. But this is an interesting one. A company that outperformed Google times 200 on the stock market company called Domino's Pizza, a company that is selling pizza, is outperforming the top technology companies in the world. That is crazy. And you know how they do it? Very simple. It's, it, for me, this is like the metaphor of two people, two friends, you know, walking in the jungle. Imagine you and your best friend walking in the jungle, and you're enjoying the scenery, the landscape. It's a beautiful day. And suddenly, a lion shows up. You know what's important at that moment? That you run faster than your friend. That is the most crucial part. You don't have to outrun the lion, you have to outrun your friend at that moment. And that is exactly what Domino's did. They said, we cannot outrun Google, but we can do a better job than Pizza Hut or Round Table Pizza. And we can be the fastest, the most easy, and the most fun one to order pizza from. And that's basically what they've done. And they shamelessly copy-pasted companies like Amazon. Uh, Amazon has the dash buttons. They have the push for pizza button. You put this on your desk, you push it, 20 minutes later, you got your pizza. They have the, the zero click app. Can you imagine that? The zero click app. You just have to open up the app and 20 seconds later, 20 minutes later, they bring your favorite pizza. They're fast, they're easy, and they're fun. But the interesting thing is, behind the scenes, how they transformed themselves. Today, half of their staff are technologists. Today, Domino's Pizza is not a pizza company anymore. Today, Domino's Pizza is a technology company that happens to sell pizza. And they've done the best job in their industry. They outperformed all the others. And because of that, they outperformed the stock market like crazy because they were con focused like crazy on convenience. And I think it's super interesting to see how convenience is not just something that happens in the digital world, but it's something that you see more and more in the offline world. Huh? I was recently in China. And uh, these are the, the Huma stores, uh, the retail concept of Alibaba. And for me, this was something that I've never seen before in the West. Um, stores that were extremely beautiful, fresh products, brilliantly showcased. Uh, but, but it's a perfect blend between on and offline interfaces. Uh, think about the, the Amazon Go stores. Uh, they, they, they released this video two years ago in Seattle. They started with a store. If you walk in, you scan your Amazon Go app, then you take out of the stores whatever you want, and you don't have to pay. It happens automatically thanks to sensors and AI technology. Uh, and this is pretty advanced stuff. Uh, today it works. Today they're rolling this out all over the US now. They got now stores in San Francisco and New York. And their plan is to open 3,000 of them in the next three years. Um, if you look in China, JD, you know, the second largest e-commerce player uh, and moving into offline retail, they saw this and they thought, ah, oh, that's fantastic. They decided beginning of this year to open hundreds of those stores this year. And then they changed their mind and they said at a certain moment, let's open up a thousand of these stores every single day. So what is happening here 
they're basically taking out everything that people hate about shopping. The waiting in line, the hustling with products, the paying, they take that out. Imagine how more convenient it becomes if you just walk in, you take what you need and you walk out. It's becoming an effortless interface and it's saving time of customers. And I think the big challenge for, let's say, normal organizations is that you have these big technology companies, these big platforms that are really, really good at that. And these are companies that are really going for world dominance. Um, every market seems to be interesting for them and they're like magnets for consumer power. Huh? They're magnets for money, magnets for talent. These are companies that don't compete in a market. These are companies that compete for a market. They don't want to have a piece of the pie. They want to have the pie. So this is a new kind of competition um, that sometimes feels strange. I don't know in India, but in Europe, sometimes we have the feeling it feels unfair because sometimes we feel that different laws and regulations apply to these companies. And sometimes it feels like this, that you have this handful of extremely powerful companies, mainly American and Chinese, and then all the rest of us, will, we're, we're like playing on the B level. Huh? And we're getting dominated really, really fast sometimes by these players. So, uh, for instance, look at the smart speaker market. Uh, Amazon is extremely successful with their Echo, with Amazon Alexa. A smart speaker, a computer without a keyboard, a virtual assistant, you know, there are different names for it. And the adoption curve is, is pretty steep right now. Uh, these are the latest figures that I've found. Um, in the US now, half of the population have a smart speaker. And if you look at what they do with it, they use it for, for basic stuff like setting timer and playing songs. But also this, buy something on Amazon. One out of three is using a voice interface to buy something which means that one out of two is saying, hey, Alexa, I need toothpaste. Can you help me with that? And then that machine says, sure, same as last time. Yes, same as last time. Okay, tomorrow morning, you have it. Uh, this is a new phase in e-commerce. It's, it's more moving into automated commerce uh, where it's not a one-button interface, it's a zero-button interface. And I think what they're doing is extremely smart. I always compare it with Facebook installing the Facebook algorithm. Uh, ten years ago, Facebook started with the Facebook algorithm, and we all know how it works. Facebook decides what content we see or that we, or we don't see, right? Uh, and we know the benefits and the downsides of it. Amazon is now doing the exact same thing, only this is not an information filter, this is a product filter. Amazon has the power to filter out which products you are exposed to and which products you're not exposed to. Imagine that they succeed. They, they have it now in about half of the U.S. households. Imagine that they go up to 75%. And they have the biggest store in the world behind that. And they can decide which products you see and you don't see. This is the biggest product filter the world has ever seen. So consumer good companies, you know, this could fundamentally change the way they have to go to market. If I want to buy cat food now and I say, Alexa, I need cat food. She, she recommends me this one. And she says, oh, Stephen, I would buy this kind of cat food. And, you know, maybe I will ask for an alternative. Maybe I will say, oh, I'll take the next one. Or maybe I will say, give me another one, Alexa. But I will never see the hundreds types of cat food that you see in large supermarkets. And today, people are using these smart speakers to inform themselves about which products to buy. Huh? Half of them is using it for product search and research. This is quite significant. And the digital shelf space will be smaller than the physical shelf space. This is placing a filter in between one large company, Amazon, and millions of other companies. It is extremely convenient for me as a user, but it's also a threat for a lot of retailers and consumer goods companies out there. But the truth is, in this phase three of AI, this is what customers want. They want them to save, they want you to save their time by faster than real-time service, by anticipating, by creating hyper-personalized services. It's not the average customer that, we're, that we worry about, it's the individual customer. And it's about having the most convenient interfaces the world has ever seen. And this is what AI can do. And the bad news is those big technology platforms, they're really good at this. The good news is I meet more and more companies that are non-native technology companies that are starting to understand this and are using this to get ready for that day after tomorrow. And, and this is my invitation to, to all of you. I think at a certain moment, we need to dare to dream about what is possible, what would be the best customer interaction and the best customer engagement we can, 
imagine. And then let's reverse engineer that back to today. And if we start out there with that dream and re reverse engineer it back, that will bring us further than just taking what we have today and incrementally improving it step by step. And phase three will invite us to do that. This is a perfect time to get ready for that day after tomorrow. Use artificial intelligence in a smart way to create new customer benefits. I'm a huge fan of that. It excites me. This is our guiding star for the future. But then, of course, the key question comes up. Huh? The team of the conference, when digital becomes human. We're at the beginning of a new S-curve. A lot is possible. Automation will improve customer experience like crazy. And then the question is, do we still need humans? And I think we all know the answer, the very simple answer. Yes, we do. And um, I'm, an, I'm an economist, and there's this old economic law that will start to play. It's the law of scarcity. When something becomes scarce, it increases in value. And the one thing that is becoming more and more scarce between companies and their customers is the human-to-human -human interaction. And because of the fact that it's scarce, it increases in value. It is decreasing in frequency, and because of that, it's increasing in value. You know, but the consequence of the digital transformation is the human transformation. We will have to do things differently in another way. I brought a video for you. Uh, for this one, we can put the sound on. And um, I just want to show it to you because for me, it symbolizes the limits of technology and the power of the human touch. Let's, let's uh, watch this video. แม่แม่ลูกผิดมาแล้วร้องใหญ่เลยแม่ต้องใส่หิ้วนมลูกลูกโอเคโอเคตัวนี้ลูกกระตุ้นลูกกระตุ้นนะกระตุ้นมากแ
And if we do that, this is human. This is what we can do. Computers personalize, people make it personal. It sounds the same, but it's a huge difference. Computers predict, but humans can surprise. Computers deliver, deliver but humans can over-deliver. At the end of the day, the only thing that we can do as humans that computers cannot is leave the script. We can leave the script. We need humans that color outside of the lines in favor of the customer. Uh, let me share you this, this anecdote with you. When, when we were in Disney World with the family a couple of years ago, we also went to their competitor across the street, Universal Studios. And my oldest son was then four and a half years old. And he was already a big fan of these water rides. And I showed him all videos I could find. I said, Siba, that's his name. I said, Siba, two more weeks and whoosh, one more week, whoosh, tomorrow. Whoosh. So he was ready. I mean, he was hyped up like never before. So we went straight to the park, straight to that ride. And as I said, I did my marketing really good, but my research was really bad because he was two centimeters short to go on the ride. Now, I don't know if you've ever had a four-year-old in your life, but maybe if you did, you remember that they have many tools to show the world that they are unhappy with the situation. And he used that tools to its full potential that morning, and that was entirely my fault. So that was a bad start of the day. And the guy from the park, the, the employee there, he saw that, so he, he came to us and he said, look, I just saw what happened, and I want to soften the pain a little bit. And I, I have this coupon here. So he brings out this coupon from his pocket, and this is a VIP coupon. And your son can use that for the rest of his life. And he will never have to wait in line again, and we're going to do all kind of cool stuff with him. So it's going to be fantastic. And I thought, wow, this is great. They thought about this. They have a solution. Fantastic. So I took this picture for my book and my presentations until I noticed that even though I like this, this had zero impact on my four-year-old son. 0, 0.0 impact. Huh? Those guys are more into the real-time solutions, not uh, in 20 years solutions. So it didn't work at all. So if, if the guy from the park would have been a robot, this is where it would have stopped because he executed this predefined script, a good script, but it didn't work. But he was human, empathic, passionate, creative. And he said, look, I see it doesn't work, but I do want to help you. What is a ride that your son would like to go to? And we said Spider-Man was next on the list. And the guy said, okay, let me see what I can do. So he grabbed his walkie-talkie, and I could overhear that conversation. And he was talking to his friend at the Spider-Man ride, explained it a little bit, and said, could you put these people on the ride for me? Oh, that's awesome, fantastic, thank you. Yes, you will recognize them, because one child has a pretty bad mental breakdown right now. Huh? So just put them on the ride. And that's what they did. And it worked out fine, and uh, before we knew it, life was good again. And you know what? It's those small things that are human. Those are the things that machines cannot understand, and humans feel that, and, and that's what we want to do with each other. And probably in 95% of the cases, it's okay to have a digital interaction, but when it really matters to you, then you don't want to talk to some sort of a machine, then you want to talk to a human. This is what differentiates us from machines, so we have to make sure that this is what our people excel in in a digital world. And, and this is my invitation from, for you. Remember the video I showed about Inside Out with the four negative characteristics? This is my invitation. If you're in a meeting somewhere in the next week and, and you're talking about a customer and your feeling is that one of these four characters is taking over the meeting, I would gladly invite you to stand up in that meeting and ask the group, what would joy do? And the more decisions joy takes in your company, the more human you will become. The more decisions these four will take, the less human you are. It's about being more joyful, being more human, showing more warmth to customers that really will help you to reach that point that I describe as when digital becomes human. I'm coming to the end of my talk. Um, I do these things because I hope that it, it gives different perspective to, to the world and help you understand the situation that we're in. Now we're at the beginning of a new phase, which is a perfect moment to really think about the future and to really dare to describe your own day after tomorrow, reverse engineer it and start developing it. And using customers as a guiding star for that is, is the way forward to reach that point of customers the day after tomorrow when digital becomes human. So if you ask me about the future of customer relationships, this is how I started this morning. 
now you have more context to understand my point of view of that. But I believe that efficiency is necessary and we need automation for that. But emotions are also necessary. We need humans for that. And think about the law of scarcity. When something becomes scarce, it increases in value. The human part is becoming scarce. And because of that, it is increasing in value. But it implies that humans will have to be acting differently, more emotionally, more doing business with the heart to stand out versus computers. So if you want to be extreme customer centric, I think most organizations are facing a double transformation. All of us have to invest a lot in digital. There's no other way. But I also recommend to invest at the same time in the human part and reach that point where you combine the strengths of digital with the strengths of human to create that unique customer relationship and to reach that point where digital becomes human. This is what I had for you this morning. Um, if you'd like to see more of me, feel free to follow me on Instagram. Um, and I hope you have a fantastic conference here. And I would really like to thank you again for having me here and for listening to my story. Thank you very much. This is the event I look forward to come and join most after Durga Pujo in Kolkata. <laughs> it's, it's always uh, fun to meet the old colleagues and uh, friends. <clears throat> it's not a very big ecosystem here, but uh, always it's a privilege to be here. Thanks, AVP Anand, to you know, uh, give me this opportunity here. So uh, today, we'll talk about 5G, IoT, and what's uh, happening around those technologies, how it's helping different industries to transform into digital. So let me start. So over the next couple of days, you'll sit here and hear a lot about business, various industry verticals, and how IoT and technology connected devices are going to help the business. So what we are talking about here in a business seminar, in a technology seminar about football. Being in Kolkata, we start with football, we end with football. Now we're in the middle of I-League and ISL and all the stuff going around us. So I thought, while putting together what is my take on digital, let's reflect a little bit on football. So let's the game begin. The time has come to change the game experience. A sport reinvents itself. Football as you've never seen it before. It begins here at this very place, Parc de Prance, the rebirth of football. A digital experience for fans, players, and staff. A network society connecting the astonishing players with the people who love them. Now, the most successful club in fringe football history will be the most technologically advanced. Capturing every moment, every detail, every second, improving your experience. With Ericsson as Paris Saint-Germain's official digital experience partner, we will bring football to a new level. More powerful, more entertaining, and more connected than ever before. For the people who love the sport. talked a lot about digital, human, and the line slowly but steadily getting blurred. 
how digital is coming and helping human in every aspect of life. So as I said in the beginning, that we can talk of use cases from various industries and you will hear them, I'm sure, over the next couple of days. But today, I will mostly talk about soccer, how it is changing the experience, how soccer is becoming digital, how players are becoming digital. We work with a lot of European football clubs, with Chelsea and with PSJ, and what we are doing to help them to become digital and how it is influencing their players to do better. So topic is from IoT, 5G, how we are developing the ecosystem. Some five years back, on the same seminar, I once said, and I still remember, that by 2020, anything which can be meaningfully connected will get connected. And we are today on the brink of a network society where we see everything is getting connected. And 5G is playing the most and crucial role in getting things connected. We talk about, and you listen about network building, network cities, healthcare, banking, network grid, and everything. So what was not possible in the past, now becoming possible with this 5G technology. We never had this kind of bandwidth available with the level of latency we expect to actually create a network society where everything can run using IoT. But as I said, that we are at the brink of the network society. And 5G is playing a very important role. So I'll spend next five minutes to just explain in a layman's word, what is 5G technology? Because you are hearing it, you are reading it all the time that 5G is coming. Initially, we thought that it will be 2020. Now we see the commercial development is taking such rapid pace that the deployment will happen by 2019 in some of the developing or developed world. So mobile phone moved, or mobile telecommunication moved from 1G to 2G to 3G to 4G to 5G now. What is the difference? The first generation of mobile phone allowed us to make calls, and people adopted it real, real fast. It took about 100 years to connect a billion places, and it took less than 10 years to connect next billion people using mobile technology. The speed of technology adoption is moving that fast. In 2G, it allowed us to send text message as well, apart from doing the regular phone calls. 3G first time gave us an opportunity on the internet mobile side. From a mobile device, for the first time you can go to internet. People were not that happy with the speed and it was not very, very popular, I must say that. 4G bridged the gap. Now for the first time again, people started consuming videos, YouTubes and others using 4G technology, which is much, much faster than 3G. And we have seen the global networks are getting choked and clogged with video traffic. 5G will have all this, but it will give you lower latency, higher speed, and a bandwidth which we never thought about in the past. It will allow you to run Ultra HD 4K videos on your mobile device on a real-time basis. So just to give you one example, what kind of speed we are talking about, it will download an Ultra HD video on your device at the time of 20 or 30 video download, what it takes in today's speed of 4G. Thousand times faster. It will use certain technology, and I'll come to those technologies 
that what is making this thing possible. 5G will also allow you to go for low latency activities. It will be a low latency network. How low? Less than one millisecond. Compare it with 4G, it's about 50 millisecond. And one millisecond is 1,000, one times of 1,000 millisecond. So that kind of speed, now for the first time it is allowing us to do things on a real-time basis. You need that kind of latency to communicate with various devices. And I'll show you what is the difference between a latency of a 4G and a 5G. It's also using a technology called massive MIMO. Multiple input, multiple output. Using the beamforming, it for the first time allows us to communicate simultaneously with a device both ways. In today's technology, actually it's a one-way communication like walkie-talkie. We don't realize all the time. First time, 5G is going to allow us to communicate both ways simultaneously using good switches. Also, it will be possible to access massive amount of data because the ports will increase. Today's radio base station, which you see outside in the towers and all, normally have about 10 to 12 ports it can handle. This one will go for 100 plus ports in a single base station. So, so much of connectivity around you, 5G will enable us to do things which we could not have done before. But now, this is the best part of my presentation according to me sitting or standing here in Kolkata. A lot of people heard about 5G as a technology, but it uses called millimeter wave. For the first time, millimeter wave will be used for mobile communication. What it does, basically, it allows us to increase the spectrum. Today's mobile phone uses about 3 kilohertz to 6 gigahertz of spectrum bandwidth. 5G will go up to 300 gigahertz of bandwidth using millimeter wave. Now, here is the Kolkata link. Millimeter wave, which is making 5G possible, was invented here in Kolkata. 123 years back, Professor J.C. Bose, not far away from where we are sitting here in Presidency College, first time implemented <laughs> millimeter wave. J.C. Bose, we know, and we are so proud as Bengalis about his contribution to science, field of science and technology, was a person who never believed in IP. Because he thought that IP is restrictive, prohibitive. If I create some kind of intellectual property, it will not allow other scientists to work on it. So he always said that I create technology, let everybody use it. And in Germany, he presented this paper and he offered the scientists over there that they can take over and build on it. Marconi took it and created the next patent for mobile communication using wireless technology. So it is nothing new. 123 years back, millimeter wave was introduced. But today, we are going to use it in 5G technology for the first time commercially. What is going to offer us? It's going to offer us a reliable network. A network where with that kind of port and that kind of higher frequency, you will not have call drops. It will provide you a much faster network, as I said, 1,000 times faster than the networks we use today. 1,000 times faster. And with a latency level of sub-second. Now, for the first time, we can see that industries can add up the IoT in a way they always wanted. It will also allow us to go for energy-saving transmission, because remember, the 5G technology was invented 
keeping in mind mostly industrial use cases. We don't need a 5G technology for making phone calls. Now, when you put, put the sensors on the street, or a car, or a flying drone, or, or in the jungles of Amazon, you cannot go there and change your battery, or you cannot go out of power. This is going to be about 100 times more efficient from power perspective. Regular sensors will require only a recharge of battery maybe in 10 years. So that is something different coming up with 5G. It will be very, very energy saving. 100 times faster video transmission. As I said, that you can actually download a full HD video in a minute's time. Okay? And millimeter wave will allow us to go for higher data capacity on the network. Industries will be chief driver of this 5G. Because it will require a lot of investment. And all the use cases we hear about autonomous car, automatic factories using robots, smart home, smart cities, smart traffic system, all this would be the primary driver of 5G. And this is going to create the massive Internet of Things possible. Because IoT, we have been hearing it for many years. You cannot connect wires everywhere, right? Especially on mobile devices, like cars and all. So you needed this kind of low latency, high bandwidth, very highly reliable network to make drones fly. Because otherwise, you'll have to wear helmet when you go out, because drones will be flying all over your head. So let's now come back to our topic today and see some of these technologies or the attributes of the technology, I would say, how it is helping making PSJ a better football team. So take an example of a low latency, less than one millisecond latency. Now I'll show you a video with some you know, uh, activities we have done with PSJ team to demonstrate them that the difference between 4G and 5G, you might find it helpful. Hi guys. How are you? Good. So today you're going to feel the difference between 4G and 5G. Good. Do you see everything? Yeah. Let's find out, bro. Now that's 4G. Now let's try 5G. Easy. Yeah. <laughs> well done, bro. Thank you. That's 5G. Okay. okay. You're going to feel the difference between 4G and 5G. We'll start with 5G. So put this on. Yep. Good. Marco, now it's 4G. Good. No, no, no. Skip us. Oh. You know, can I switch? Yeah, yeah, of course. No, no, no. <laughs> Sassy, the football.
a small demo to see the difference in latency. Like it is using the same server. You are viewing it from here, from your phone, using a 4G, and then there's a camera on top of your head, and there's a difference in latency. We don't get it, but when you go for mission critical application, this will be very, very important. This will always uh, be utilized for things where we need haptic feedback. You know, uh, let's take an example. If you are driving a car, let's say it's a robotic car, right? And on the screen you are seeing that it's a road and you are going up and down, and if you don't, your steering don't give you that haptic feeling, you will not be able to drive, it will, you will crash. When it becomes important, if you are using a robotic arm to go and drill somewhere inside a mine, and if the miner who is using this remotely cannot feel the tremor, he will not be able to put the drill appropriately. Even interestingly, when we work with King's College in London, using 5G technology to do remote surgery, and I'll show you one of this video, and the doctor says that without this feeling, you cannot do surgery. You cannot cut somebody's body when you are not feeling that tremor or that haptic feedback. And with one millisecond latency, you can actually get that in normal 4G technology, you cannot. So moving on to the next one, the greater, greater data capacity. We discussed a lot in the morning session and we'll continue to discuss that digital will require huge amount of data, unprecedented in our industry. Like we never thought that we will be storing so much of data, we'll be analyzing so much of data for making any decision. But without data, Digital will not work. So you need on a real-time basis to process those data. So when we work with these soccer teams, we put microchip inside those balls they use, and we put chips on your, their bodies, on their you know, boots, and, and, and socks, and, and, and jerseys. So when they are jumping, when they're moving and turning, we can tell them by gathering that data on a real-time basis, are they doing things right? So we'll see that. If the football is going to be digital, or digital will take over the football very soon. Det känns väldigt bra att bli en del av Paris Saint-Germain. Jag hoppas vi ska vinna allt. Ici c'est Paris. Jag kommer att använda min tekniska expertis för att Paris Saint-Germain ska lyckas. Paris är magik. These new recruits are going to help Paris Saint-Germain to become more digital. But nobody has actually heard of them. Not possible like that, huh? Who are they? These engineers from Ericsson, a world leader in information and communication technologies, may not be hitting the field. They are real experts when it comes to digital transformation. They are here to bring Paris Saint-Germain their expertise in sports performance data. For each match and training session, they gather data that is then analyzed and used by staff and players to optimize the team's sports performance. Ericsson provides fans, both at the ground and elsewhere, with a new digital experience that will let them live their passion for their club from the inside. With Paris Saint-Germain and Ericsson working as a team, football is a science. So now football is becoming a science, and as I said, that we'll hear a lot on the other side of the industry. It's not about the soccer, in manufacturing and mining and public safety, autonomous vehicle, what 5G as a technology and IoT, what kind of change is going to drive uh, you know, in our life and society as a whole. And each of them are very, very positive. <clears throat> we work with a miner, a mining company in Europe, and where their biggest problem is uh, safety of the miners. You know, mines are one of the most hazardous places to work. And if we can use the technology to do the remote operation, put the sensor to see the air quality inside the mine and manage the blast and see the post-blast situations, it is going to help a lot of people's life. And same with public safety. 
like until and unless we'll use this kind of technology, we'll never be able to detect the kind of fire hazard we had in California this year or in China, the fire disaster we had a couple of years back in one of their chemical factories. So we will see with 5G and IoT that more and more digital solutions will be coming with the reliable network, with beam forming and energy saving transmission, with low latency network, with greater data capacity and faster transmission. So these are the things we are going to notice for sure. And then if we take another, and my last use case is on healthcare. You know this happens. This is the player Danny Alves uh, from Brazil's World Cup team. And a lot of Brazil supporters are here and some Argentinian I'm supposing here in Calcutta. But Danny Alves, when he got injured or any players get injured, then we need to move them from that place to maybe a place where they can get the right kind of treatment. And as I said, with 5G, with this haptic feedback and low latency network, perhaps we can bring the doctor remotely to you, need not transfer the patient all the time. So this is uh, one of the doctors from King's College London, and they, he is working with us to see how he can help the society as a whole using the technology. We need to disrupt the way we see medical treatment. If you see an open surgeon operating, they will have a bit of tremor at the ends of their scalpel. The robotic instruments are computerized, so they have absolutely no tremor. There is one problem though, there is no sense of touch at the end of the instruments. It is very difficult to transmit across remote distances and across current robotic systems. In order to do this with haptic feedback technology, you need two things. You need network slicing and you need cloud data sharing. I think both are possible through 5G. It also allows us to bring the best education internationally to the next generation of doctors. It gives us the opportunity to educate anyone anywhere. Often we have to go to their hospitals, to their sites, to mentor them. With 5G, I think we might be able to do just that, sitting here in my office or in my own operating room, looking at someone operating elsewhere in the world and being able to mentor and guide them, learn the best principles of surgery. The potential future applications of the technology are not just rapid diagnostics, better robotics. I think there are others, such as the treatment of disabled patients, remote surgery, and also in rehabilitation of those who need it most. Time is so short, time is so valuable. Why take the doctor all the time to the patient and vice versa? Why don't we have a wonderful communication link between the doctor and the patient? Global health, particularly care of the elderly, is becoming a major challenge for the next generation of doctors. We need a better way of communicating with these elderly people. 5G might just be the answer. So, this is where we started, when digital become human. What happens? I don't think digital will become human, or human will become digital. I think this two different entities are going to help human being to live a better life, will allow us to enjoy better game of soccer. It will also allow us to see a less polluted, a better society around us with massive internet of things. It will increase the productivity among us and it will give us certain solutions which we could never thought before without this huge digital transformation. So we started with football, Paris Saint-Germain, and we end with the soccer and see what digital is doing over there. Hey, toi. Uh, 
Ouais, quand même, ouais. Je travaille pas avec des amateurs. Allô Allô transformation for them football becomes a science thank you very much enjoy rest of the seminar good morning to all of you earlier we used to take a bio break now we talk about digital break looks like after two sessions all of all of you have started checking mobile phone so request all of you to stay focused for this session. So next uh, 20 minutes, I will take you to some concept of how the society will react, how we all will react when the digital becomes human. The last 10 years, last 10 years is the era of digital disruption. The last 10 years, is the era of inventors. The inventors are dominating the world economy. What we have seen in last 10 years, we have seen iPad. It was not there 10 years back. We have seen iPhone. We have seen 4G. Uber is new to us. We can't live without Uber. Uber was not there 10 years back. We have seen Google Map, that is part of our life. I was coming from Bangalore today, morning 4.30, I stuck in a traffic jam. I was desperately checking Uber, whether I will be able to make the flight or not. So it's a part of our life today. Instagram, Snapchat, Tesla, Bitcoin. So you can see the series of things which has come in last 10 years which was not there. And most amazing, the 50% of the Fortune 500 companies are new. According to the statistics, the Fortune 500 list in 2002, and if you compare that with today, 52% of that company either have gone bankrupt or sold or moved out of Fortune 500 list. And this revolution is led by the technology. It is by the digital disruption. But the key question is what is ahead of us? What lies ahead? What is next? How do we see the next 10 years of our journey? We see the robots in our home today morning when Steve was showing how robots are kid, his kids are playing with the robots. I was smiling. Yes, the robots are part of the family. Robots are te our teacher at home. Robots will be the teacher at home. Robots will act as a elderly care. It will has act as a house staff house assistant, can mop a floor. So we see that robots will be part of the family and it will be really part of the family when it can blend with the family emotionally and socially. We will see the robots in the factory. So what we see tomorrow, that more of a human and machine will co-work in the factory. Sometimes we say that everything will be automated. Everything will be taken away by robot. We believe it's no. What we believe in the future, human and machine will work together and in the factory, in the workplace, where human need to learn to work with the robots Robots need to learn to work with the human. Robots, whenever we thought, think, it is all about a huge, gigantic thing with a big eyes and like a 
extraterrestrial kind of creature. No, it can be very small. It can be nanobots. It can be injected in our bloodstream. The University of Arizona and Nanobot Institute of China are doing the research and they are developing the nanobots which can be injected in the blood to administer medicine in more effectively. They are administering the medicine in a rat so far and they have experimented that the tumor can be removed much faster with nanobots. So what do we believe in next 10 years, this will, will be part of the very major part of our, some of the critical treatments. This is familiar that in the future, that whole crime management will be prevent, will be preventive management will happen with the technology. It happens today. In today, if you go to the airport, a lot of cameras has got a visual recognition capability. It takes the photos in the front and in the back end, it checks with the master's photos with the wanted list and alert the securities. But it will happen in the future more is not only this with the spec, they will see what is in front of us. They will see beyond. They should be able to predict that what is coming up. What does all this thing mean to us? The bad news is 75 million jobs will be disappeared according to World Economic Forum's future of job reports of 2018. But the good news is 133 million jobs will be created. 133 million jobs will be created with the power of technology with the power of AI, with the power of digital. But what is important to understand that what job will be disappear, that will disappear. That is inevitable. We cannot stop that. And job may disappear in India, in Kolkata. Not necessarily the job will be created in Kolkata. Maybe job will be created in other parts of the globe, in China. Maybe the job will disappear in the factories in China. And the new job will be created in India or in Japan or in some other country. So if you have to capture the new job, if you have to be relevant in the new economy, one need to embrace the change. You should not resist the change. You need to embrace the change and be leader in the new. The new jobs will look very different. In the future, the new, some of the new jobs which are coming up will look very different. Like in Accenture, we recruit large number of technology people across the globe. In the past, we used to recruit, go to engineering college, recruit electronics, computer science, so on and so forth. Now we recruit the social media manager. We need the human machine interaction, interaction designer. You need a very different job. You need a data scientist where you need a more skill like mathematics statistics. You need a human interaction designer. What does that thing mean? We are talking about the driverless car. If you have to design the driverless car, that car should understand how human behave. Human should understand how automated car will behave. Have you ever seen in the roads in Calcutta, busy roads, slow traffic, suddenly somebody crossing the road like this in two hands and without looking at the whether the cars are coming or not? everywhere in the country. Because we trust, we see that some driver is there, they will look at my two hands and stop. So can I trust the sensors, whether it will stop or not, if I see there is no driver? I will hesitate. Similarly, cars are designed that if there is a red signal, it should stop. Green signal, it should go. But in the middle of the night, when I go back home from the airport, I tell my driver, if it is a green signal, you should be more careful. 
because from the other side somebody will just come and hit you. So that is how the human behaves. So the question is that when you design the system, this type of system, the, the interactions are very, very different. So new jobs will come and to capture the new jobs, the, all the country needs to get prepared. Like when you talk about the IT services industry, India is the leader. When you talk about artificial intelligence, China is ahead of us by miles. China is ahead of us in miles. So the question is that even, even within India, some st when the whole IT revolution started in India, the some state were ahead of the other state and created a lot of capability and jobs. Again, now whole thing is starting fresh. There will be opportunity for everywhere. How do you train your people? How do you build the new skill? How do you make the country state relevant so that you can capture the new? That is the challenge in front of us, and that is what we need to work. So when the digital become human, it is all about the technology. And I'm sure in this room there are many people who are in the startups or starting the business or in the IT services industry or in the technology industry. You talk about that I'll give a little broad guideline how systems should be developed. The three points, three overarching theme I leave with you. We call that the future of systems when it will be developed. We said that the future systems should be boundaryless. What I mean by boundaryless, that all the IT stack between the network, infrastructure, storage will disappear. It will all about the code, it will all about the software. The boundaries between the human and the machine will disappear. So when you develop the system, you need to understand that how both behaves. So that is the boundaryless. We need to build the systems which are adaptive. The adaptive means that it is the days are over that where I'll build some system and that will run for 20 years exactly the same way. So the, with the change of business, that whole system has to evolve and the change. So that is the adaptive the part of the development. And third thing, the system should be radically human. When I say radically human, because today's, tomorrow's systems are, will take decisions. They are all powered by artificial intelligence. They will have a judgment. They will take a decision. I'll give you an example. There are banks in Japan. In 2015, they started using the robots, nanobots in the counter for customer interaction. Is it happening in India? Yes, it is happening in India. At least two banks already started pilot. They put the robots in the counter in their bank for the customer interaction. Now, think about these robots. Now, they are interacting with the client every day, and they are interacting with the customers every day, and they are learning with the data. And suppose if it happens that when it approves loan, they see that the one particular community or group or a segment in the society normally get rejected for loan because of financial reason, many reasons. But once that happens, that robot learns with that past data. And next time when anybody from that community apply for loan, even if that person is perfectly qualified, the system may get biased and reject the loan. So that is the, that is the a bias of the data. So the point is that when you develop the system in the future, we need to make sure the system should behave ethically. Systems should be biased free for the society. So that is about the radically human. It should share the same value system like human, then only the machine will be human. Then only it will be digital, will be human. But, you know, we can build system. I can talk about the guideline that how to build systems in the future. But at the end of the day, digital will be human when it enhances the human progress. 
digital will be human when it enhances the human progress and when it brings the smile in the face of a child. Before I close, I'll show you one small video to explain that how you can use the technology to bring this smile in the face of a child. So let us see this video. Hello everybody, this is Pierre Nanterre, I'm chairman and CEO of Accenture, live from Davos. This was not a technical glitch. Last 30 seconds, what you have experienced, 450 million people in this planet, 5% of our world population who has got a hearing difficulties feel exactly the same way every day, every month, every year in throughout their life. I remember I had an uncle and you know, seven, late 70s and 80s, early 80s, when first television came to Calcutta, we bought black and white TV at home. And every Sunday evening, there was a Bengali black and white movie they used to tell, uh, you know, project. And in the family, it was like a big event. Everybody will gather in the TV room and watch. But my uncle used to sit outside. He was not included. He cannot participate in the TV show. Cartoons, every children in the world, wherever you go, they enjoy cartoons at home. We went to a school in Bangalore for hearing impaired. And what we did, we played the cartoon there in that school. When we played that cartoon, we found they are not interested. They could not enjoy. They could not understand. They could not smile looking at the cartoon. So we thought that we should do something. We should do something to use technology to bring smile in the face of these children. So in Accenture, we have a you know, initiative called Tech for Good. How do you use technology? for the good of the society. So the team came up with a product called Sanketik, which is sign language. So whenever there is a video is played on the real time basis, it translates into Sanketik language, sign language. And it used the natural language processing, it used the machine learning, it used the artificial intelligence, it used the video processing, whole lot of technology is required to do the real-time translation of a voice into sign language. So once we did that, we went back to the school and we played that same video again. So they started smiling. So when digital will be human, when it will extend the human race, and it will bring back the smile in the face of a children. That is all what I wanted to share with you. Thank you. Good morning. So it's always a great pleasure to come to my Karma Bhumi, which is Calcutta, and the city of Kolkata now. And thanks to Infocom and Kalida, so, you know, to make me come again over here. So, when I first heard about the uh, theme of the uh, theme of the event, so I was just wondering, you know, what does it mean? You know, we are into digital transformation, you know, technology and stuff like that. But I was wondering what, what exactly is the meaning of digital becoming human? 
So like all of us, what we do in our daily life, I Googled it. That's the easiest thing to do nowadays. And uh, to my, I mean, I was happily, I was happy to see there's the name of a book written by Stevenson. So, uh, so what I did was, of course, you know, I downloaded the uh, book from Amazon and read it in my multiple hopping flights, you know, in the last 15 days or fortnight. And I got, I was very excited to read the book because we are a service provider. I, I, I lead a team of team, you know, who provides a lot of services to our customers in the, and help them in their digital transformation journey. So it was very insightful to me. Now, when I heard, heard him today talking, you know, it was such a great presentation. I thought this is the meaning of when digital becomes human. So I got a human touch of Steve explaining to all of us what is the meaning of digital becomes human and so, so many insights, deep insights, nice examples, you know, which are very close to our emotion. So that was when, you know, I thought, you know, that I must thank, thank him for this. I must thank him for this wonderful book he has written. There are a lot of, lot of very insightful input which I have got, you know, just by listening to him. And I personally have been an absolutely customer of this guy. So I was never, I, I mean, I always, you know, I was always to be questioned that I was never a classroom trained. I, I'm not, I, I cannot be trained, I thought. But all my experiences in life, at least the position where I've reached today is because of my customers. So I, I personally value this customer rela relationship immensely. And I personally always strive towards, you know, working towards that goal. So a lot has been spoken about the digital model. I have found, you know, I thought I created that mod, uh, created this definition. I have been talking about that for a long time. The simplest definition of a digital model is when the consumer gets directly connected to the services without any intermediate layer. So all the digital service providers are exactly trying to do the same thing, how they can connect with the consumer without much of layers, which, as he was pointing out, can be really annoying at times. So when the customer, when the consumer is directly connecting, getting connected to the services, and it is exactly that feel, that exactly the feel, I mean, I mean, almost like an umbilical cord over a period of time between a brand and a consumer or a service and a consumer which gets, which gets developed over a period of time. And that point of time, what is the most important thing is customer experience. I think, I mean, by this time we, we, we know, you know, right from the morning session till the speaker just before me, how important is the customer experience. So experience is the new king. So, now what I will do is I will kind of touch upon two contrasting profiles of customers or consumers for that matter in India, and I will take some Indian context. So, uh, you know, I, we heard Steve, you know, talking about the Indian example, you know, you'd be happy to see the Indian examples. So on one hand, we have the Generation Z, not the Generation Y, Generation Z, who was born, who were born predominantly around 1995 and beyond, in an India context, and it's a Kolkata context, it is more about the day, I mean, in 1995, mobile telephony got launched in India. And the first city where it got launched in India, or launched in India was Kolkata. I was the first day mobile phone user. I was carrying, and fortunate to carry, a, I don't remember the name of the model, a Motorola MicroTrac 500, which was, a, uh, which was the costliest model at that point of time, 16 rupees of outgoing calls, and probably eight rupees of incoming calls. I still remember the rates, but I got it free. And that was a great experience for me. So those generations which, who was born after 1995, they are a different kind of generations. So, okay. So, you know, if you really see the characteristics of the, uh, characteristics of the generation, first of all, they are digital born. They are digital born. They are, they are social media proficient. I mean, they are into Facebook and WhatsApp, I think, you know, right from the time, you know, I mean, maybe they, 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 they are in class five or class six. They are highly automation savvy. I see my kid, you know, when he was even 10 years back, how automation savvy he was, you know, they love. So digital is their second language. So after their mother tongue, digital is their second language. Technology is their second language. So you'll be dealing with a huge upsurge of this community who will become a very big part of the consumer segment. And that, is, and, and that is a very important part to be noted. The second part is the contrasting part, which is the, in an Indian context, the entire rural population in India, who are, who are not really digitally touched, 
but thanks to the penetration of mobile phone in India, they are, they are gradually coming to the mainstream, but they are the quality of internet, you know, uh, the, the, they are not smartphone savvy, they are not probably, I mean, by and large, not that rich or that, you know, economically, uh, uh, you know, positioned to buy smartphones. Uh, the, the, uh, at times, you know, the family shares one phone. I mean, it is normally owned by the male member in most of the cases. So this is the, this is the contrasting picture of the emerging consumer base in India. So as service providers, we, 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 we need to deal with these two contrasting, you know, consumer base, both of them growing at a very, very fast rate, and who will be the most important, probably two segments, whom we have to service as service providers. So a lot has been spoken about this, but I just thought of capturing some characteristics, you know, as a consumer, you know, right from, right from purchasing, doing online purchases, you know, uh, subscribing to fitness services, doing our banking and, you know, buying insurance online, Many examples, you know, around healthcare, uh, I mean, downloading music and, uh, music and, you know, listening online. All of us, all of us today, I'm sure, all of us in the room, you know, we experience these day in and day out, almost every hour and every minute of the day. So, if you really look at these, like, what are the characteristics of these services? You know, some of the services are free, and of course, these are all delivered to mostly through digital channels. Some of the services are free, some are subscription-based, and they are almost real-time, and... More importantly, most of them are driven by algorithms, and some of them are personalized services, right? So we are, we are, we are basically dealing with so many different kind of parameters. You know, we as service providers, or, or, or the consumer service providers who are providing digital services to the consumer part of the, uh, you know, customer base, that it is important to note now that there are trends which are emerging, but which are the two trends which are going to redefine going to redefine probably the customer relationship or the future. And in fact, I believe that it has already started now, and we have, we have had you know, a lot of examples cited by my previous speakers. So the two trends are, trend number one, when algorithm will replace experts. Algorithms are gradually replacing experts, but there are cases where, and I heard Amitabh talking about that, where that football coach, who will be using analytics and data and algorithms to make more efficient and better footballers. And I was listening to him. I think Brazil need a lot of algorithms because they are not really doing well. So <laughs> unless they do well, they will lo lose a lot of their supporters in the city of Kolkata. I think he mentioned there are more number of Brazil supporters in Calcutta. And you know, I think they will, they, will, they, will, they will go and start supporting some of the team. So this is one example. And there are always a combination of this expert-driven and algorithm-driven you know, algorithm-driven uh, trends. So this is an area which is, for every service provider, you know, need to make a judgment, what will be the customer services model? What will be the service delivery model? Will it be completely expert-driven, or it will be mostly algorithm-driven, or it should be a combination of both? The trend number two is where access, the shared access is taking over ownership. We no longer own many things. So it is like, you know, when you go, I mean, a lot of people, we, I mean, we, we are paranoid about buying new cars. Uh, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, when you get your first job, buying your car, car was a kind of, you know, dream idea, right? I remember I bought a second-hand Maruti 800 car, you know, when I, when I was in HCL. But today, if you really see, our, our ability to roam around in the city or move from one part of the city to the other part of the city is not dependent on, on the purchase of a car. So... You can access through Uber, Uber through Ola, cab anytime, any part, any any part of the city. So now, you know, I am neither a technologist. I think I'm more on the business side and, and on the customer relationship side. But I thought of bringing some theory around this. So if I plot this for future customer-centric models, and plot this in two in two axes. X axis is the consumption experience of the, of, of the customers, and Y axis is the value axis, value creation axis of the customers. We see there are very interesting examples, which are based on interesting models, rather, which are, which are coming up. So there are, there are models which are predominantly, or there are consumers who are, who, are, who, are, who are getting the service, which is predominantly ownership-based. 
but as we have discussed that, as, we, as, I, as I've just mentioned, the ownership is gradually moving to the shared access model. And the value creation is moving away from expert driven to algorithm driven. But I think an organization has to make a choice. It is not that, you know, one is more important than the other. It is not that, you know, the top part of the X axis is more important than the, than the Y part. It's always a combination of both. I am not here to suggest who should do what, but I thought of, you know, picking up some examples. Like, for example, you know, the Indian example of Kent Aro. All of us know about what Kent Aro does. Now, what we find is Kent Aro, if the machine needs maintenance, okay, so my wife, she does not call up Kent Aro anymore. So Kent Aro can actually send a signal, you know, obviously IoT, you know, through sensors, to the customers, I, mean, I don't know whether they really, you know, uh, go, go, uh, whether they go to, I, I'm, I'm sure it goes to the cloud, and definitely it gets, it triggers a service call. So you will find them, and you can get an, you know, text on your, or through whatever, or maybe an app update if they have an app, that the service engineer will visit, you know, will visit the, visit your home at this time of the day on this date. So the visit of the service engineer is the human part of it when the entire thing has got taken over by the algorithm. So the, 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 the not so interesting part of it, calling, and calling a, you know, a customer support uh, number and then booking the call, you know what happens, all of, us, all of us know what happens when you try to call a customer support help desk, right? So the boring part of it has been taken away and I thought it's a great example where, where the algorithm driven and, the, and you know, the, the, the good connect between the automation and, and, and human. So similarly, we have examples of, you know, platform. The platform model is typically the great example is Amazon, where a lot of these, you know, product companies will come and register in Amazon, and they don't own anything. What they have to do is, you know, even a startup company, they can product, you know, they can put their uh, product on Amazon, and and all of us know what happens after that. So there are more examples. For example, the artisan examples, which is like experts need to need to fulfill the ownership model, where it, this is a Kolkata example of Sabba Sachi, for example, he's a designer, and his, his you know, his, his, his you know, uh, the, 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 his output is, is very precious, right? And he doesn't do it for everyone. So at times you need highly customized, expert-driven output or products and services, which will, all, which will also exist. And of course, we know the examples of, example of Netflix, or even, you know, LinkedIn, which are a combination of access and expert driven. So in LinkedIn, I don't know how many of you have noticed that you get, you get, you get career advice, or you get connected to the right places within the professional community, you will get, you know, which are, which I believe is, is partly a, partly, you know, a driven by algorithm and also driven by experts. Because I don't think, you know, uh, I mean, whether, whether it will make a lot of sense to, to make it completely algorithm based, but what I understand from one of the LinkedIn guys is that it's a combination of algorithm and experts. So I believe these are the various, at least four, I'm sure there'll be more and more models which will emerge, and Steve, and he will write a new book, you know, in the coming days, which we look forward definitely, okay? But this I thought of providing you a perspective, you know, our perspective of, you know, plotting that in, the, in a graph, graphical form and trying to make it easy for understanding purpose. So in the middle of all these things, there's an, there's a new breed of ICT service provider who is emerging. So at SIFI, I believe we are one of the new breed of ICT service provider, you know, who is emerging with a lot of new models of which I call it a business outcome based delivery. So we are the, we the first private internet service provider in the country. And from there, wherever we have reached here today, is because of multiple transformations, you know, which our company has driven internally. There is no other company who was born in 1995. Incidentally, SIFI was born in 1995, which I just recollected. And there's no company who, who, who basically succeeded to so much of changes in the market and is, and is here where it is, it is today. And I think this is predominantly because of the number of transformation, you know, which we have driven in our company, uh, which are highly customer aligned which are highly customer aligned. So the new breed of service providers, their job is a little different than simply putting up data centers or creating cloud infrastructure or setting up networks. 
or probably you know or probably you know uh, building applications so the emerging model is less hardware less people and less license most of the organizations most of the large it organizations they they thrived on this model either they were selling more hardware or they are selling more licenses or supplying more people that was that was indian it for a very very long time and all of us know the lack of ips in this you know you know as far as the indian uh, indian it successful it companies are concerned but the new model is around the philosophy of less hardware less people and less license so the earlier model of assets plus services so when we engage with our client earlier what we used to do is we used to supply some equipments software application combine that in a system integration model take the money up front in the first 12 months or 18 months and then have a very small you know recurring contract with those clients so that model today is has evolved into multiple other three different kind of models the first model is model is the component based model which is still a primitive one which is more like ne buying a network or buying a mobile phone okay but the more prevalent one in the cloud era cloud is the fundamental of the digital transformation you know uh, uh, digital transformation services more in the cloud era it, uh, the users based model is getting more and more attention and momentum so the users model based model is nothing but an utility model like electricity you pay you, you pay how much you use the simplest example of an users model is electricity but the next model where we are working we as a, we are, we we are cfi as an organization is on business outcome based model so i will try to give you some examples what how does it translate to the customer's benefit so so you, you you here see you know four four verticals which you have which you have identified where we want to come out with business outcome based models so for a utility company we have i think somnatha you'll be able to connect uh, for a utility company we have we have you know delivered a delivered a solution where we only charge the customer on the basis of per consumer per month of billing nothing else so we believed that as an utility distribution company our customers should focus on delivering the right kind of services which is related to utility and not bother so much about it number 1 number 2 you also believed that we also believed that the the outcome model so how does an utility company build their customers it is on the basis of you know per month usage build for the client so evolved a model where we are also billing the customer exactly in the model they are billing their end consumers so basically the ict input cost model is equal to the end consumers payment model and i strongly believe and i have got a lot of conviction in this because probably some of the customers are not ready to ready to you know accept this kind of models at this point of time because their buying model is also evolving but i believe this is the model which are going to which which are going to be the winner in the coming days we are working with a healthcare company where you know we have partnered with a radiotherapy very 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 highly specialized radiotherapy organization uh, radiotherapy technology company so what we do is we have worked with them created a cloud model where the radiotherapy i don't know how much you, how many of you know what happens when a patient has to undergo radiotherapy there are technologies like there are good machines but the most important element is a human element which is a doctor who need to do the radio planning so when a patient goes for radio planning uh, for radio therapy the first day is not the therapy but first day is the planning where an exact you know exact plan will be made and they do some you know physical modeling to pinpoint the tumor location to find that out where exactly is that and to attack that you know through the radio therapy the whole success of a radio therapy you know uh, treatment is how precisely you will be able to connect to that tumor without really hampering or damaging the nearby or the you know nearby cells right that is the whole and that's why all the innovations are happening with varian which is a you know one of the advanced radio therapy technology company and sifi we have evolved this model what we have done is we have partnered with them we got the entire data normally what used to happen is the radio therapy machine and the servers and compute everything used to be in the hospital right so we have taken out those server storage and everything we have we we bring the entire data to our cloud now that is not the best part of it 
the best part of it is that a doctor sitting in US, a doctor sitting in US can get this data online and do a radio planning. So with, from an India context, and I see a lot of you know, delegates from Bangladesh, from Bangladesh context, where the scarcity may not be technology, because technology is available today. That's the good news. But not so good news is the availability of experts. Algorithms are available. Experts are becoming extinct you know, more and more. I mean, there are lesser experts you know, in comparison to the options available with algorithms. So this provides a great opportunity, you know, for for those that part of the world where the doctors, the experts, expertise of the doctors are limited. So, so the so this is the second example where probably you know from a human care perspective. So there is a patient, there is a radiotherapy machine, and there is a doctor. Okay, and doctor is completely you know is somewhere else. Now my last example where I really felt, I, this example I was really able to connect with his book, where digital meets human. All of us heard about India Post. So India Post is an age-owned institute, you know, set by the British, Britishers when they were ruling India. They run the postal service. It's one of the oldest institutes in India, right? They were at the verge of almost closing down, if you really ask me. They will not talk about that, <laughs> but I, I mean, all of us know with emails, with this, you know, FedEx or, you know, with this, with this private, you know, logistics companies, in the age of e-commerce, what would happen to them? India Post realized this, the government realized this, irrespective of which government it was. So they, they laid out a massive transformation plan for India Post, a massive transformation plan. So India Post today is a bank, it, it, it I mean, it, it now resells insurance, but what I'm hearing is that they will become an insurance company themselves. They have, they have launched mobile banking, mobile payment bank. And I was invited as, as one of the delegates over there to, in, in the inaugural event. So just imagine what has happened. This is such a beautiful example of, of the combination of digital technologies and human. So the, I mean, if you really you know, look back, what was the image of a postman? The image of a postman was the postman will deliver a letter to the remote corners of the of India, right? Of course, in the metros or A-class cities, B-class cities, but those stories, those romantic stories, there are a lot of movies which have been made. They connect between a postman and that rural Indian village woman. There's an emotional connect to the extent that the that postman used to read letters because they are they are not literate; they can't even read letters. To the extent he used to write letters also. You know, that voice, conversion of voice into something, you know, in physical form. Right? So it was happening for a long time. But just imagine what has happened here. India Post as an organization at a business level and, and you know, transformation. And, and, and if you recollect my rural, rural example, this is, this is a great initiative which can actually digitize, uh, break the digital divide between rural India and urban India. So today a postman has become a banker because he will go with a mobile phone to the village and help the villager to do online money transfer or to receive money or to do banking, number one. But I think he's the biggest, he's the biggest digital coach because today we have digital models, but we don't have digital coaches, right, who, who are human. So this is a huge transformation of not only of India Post, but a huge transformation in the, in the digital delivery, service delivery model to the remotest part of India. Thank you. A young girl and a boy from different parts of UP saw something that may I noticed here. Some of you are not sitting properly. So I can't help but you will have a pain in the lower back. This is an epidemic in our country, isn't it? A lot of people today have pain in the lower back because they don't sit properly. We are slouching, we are bending, sometimes go like this. So the kid said, maybe there should be sensors on the back. Unless you press them, you won't be allowed to do work. So on the computer, there will be a message, sit properly, I will not let you do work. Or there will be some music which will start playing and you are disturbed. Now imagine, we have the problem 
almost three fourths of the people here had, had, must have had once or the other time some pain in the back, unfortunately. That's a serious problem of professionals today. But this didn't occur to us. It occurred to these young kids who saw the problem and were able to identify a solution. Look at this example. Again, another example from a girl of class eight. Class eight. Patna, from very poor family, Shalini. Many of you might know that when people can't balance, they use a walker. Somebody around you or your family or your relatives must have used walker. My wife, Sadhana, uses walker because she can't balance. But she noticed that her grandfather couldn't use walker on the steps. So if you can't use walker on the steps, then what do you do? Can't the front legs become flexible? She wrote on a piece of paper, just two lines. Our team got this walker built, tested it. Today we have a walker which will have shorter legs when you climb up and longer legs when you climb down, uh, come down. And such a walker does not exist in USA, in Europe, anywhere in the world. So it is not just a solution to an Indian problem. It's a solution to the universal problem. A class eight kid could solve a universal problem. Problem of people can't balance all over the world. Then what prevents us from scaling up this possibility of coming out with great ideas from around us and in our team. So how do we unleash the creativity and innovative potential of our teams? That is the obvious question that this meeting is trying to address. And one of the ways in which we can do that is to understand that it is not the lack of creativity, it is the built-in guillotine that we put. I asked my students, how many of you have made a list of ideas that you got in your mind, creative ideas. You know, the moment idea comes to my mind, the reaction is, but this can't be done. If it was so easy, somebody would have done it. Such a nonsensical argument. Why do we make that an argument? These kids did not think about that, you know? Because just because nobody has done it, how can I do it? How can it be my idea which will make the winning edge? Probably that is the barrier to creativity in our teams, one of the major barriers. We need to come over, overcome that. And how do we overcome that? By finding ways in which we can create beautiful examples. These girls saw that many boys, and sometimes nowadays girls also drive motorbikes, they don't put helmet. Simple idea. So what do you do? Small Bluetooth circuit that unless you put the helmet on, the motorcycle will not start. Good for them. Good for the parents who are worried about their children, whether they will come back safe and the accident prone that our traffic is. Simple idea. This must create currency. How do we create that kind of an environment at all levels? Let me give, give you an example from techpedia.in. This is a database we created with 200,000 information of 200,000 engineering projects done by 500,000 students or 600, 700,000 students all over the country. Why did we do that? We didn't want any student of our country to do what has been done before. Originality. If there's no originality, there is no innovation. So look at this from IIT Kanpur. Simple idea. She saw how children climb the stairs. They climb backwards, you know? Little kids, they climb backwards. If they climb backwards, why couldn't we make a manual wheelchair which climbs backwards? There are two of the Gandhian Young Technological Innovation Award is sitting here. I'm so happy that they're here because the solution that our students are developing uh, Madhurima and her colleague, their students developed a spoon for Parkinson, people affected by Parkinson. So when your hand shakes, sometimes the food falls. How do you create a spoon which will not shake? Simple idea, but very effective one. And I was asking them, and I don't mind my saying this, I was asking them, why don't you take it to the market? Sir, we are academics. So what? Academics can't be entrepreneurs? Surely they can be entrepreneurs. But it is true that we would like them to be in the academic institutions. So maybe some entrepreneur has to be connected to them. Who will make this connection? Media. Anand Bajar Patrika will have to make this connection. And all of us who are here will have to make this connection. Because we don't want to waste them to the academic world. I mean, we need inspired teachers in academic world. But we also need their ideas to go to market. And therefore, can there have one leg be in the academia, another leg be in the enterprise, and we connect entrepreneurs who know how to do the same thing over and over again. Please remember, 
the attitude, the mindset of an entrepreneur is different from a mindset of an innovator. Innovators often can't do two things alike. Entrepreneur has to make batch by batch consistent production. This will bore the academic because they can't, they don't want to repeat, do the repetitive things. So please understand that we need to create an ecosystem where we can make these connections. We can make these connections. Uh, this is a very low cost diagnostic tool. This is very interesting. Many times deaf and dumb people can't communicate with normal people. So what do you do? You have an image processing software which converts their sign language into text. Here now you can read what they are saying. You can uh, write what they can read and the communication begins. There was a girl from MIT Pune and she designed two rings. So if a deaf and dumb girl wants to dance, how does she dance? She must get cue of the music. She can't listen. So there were two rings which will get vibration. So whether she has to move this hand or that hand, the rings will give her an indication. Beautiful idea. Her company's name was Sway. She got investment. She's now doing very well. So my, po my point is that there are huge number of ideas tens of thousands of ideas that we have been able to, Honeybee Network has pulled, but these ideas are not going where they should go. We go, we walk in different parts of the country and are able to find innovations all over. How can the companies find the innovation? Let me show a simple example, which I'm sure you will find it interesting. And perhaps you may be able to, sorry, just one minute. You may be able to replicate that. You know, fertilizing imag imagination. What is the fertilizer? What is the manure? What is the growth promoter for our imagination? Is there a way in which your teams can become more imaginative? They start imagining the impossible. They start imagining things that others are not even able to imagine because that is the precursor of innovation. I want to do something which has not been done before and I want to do it now, and I want to do it here, and I want to do it with the resources that we have. So frugal innovations essentially require getting more out of less. How do we do that? So one of the fertilizer for imagination is surprise. The day we are not surprised, we have not lived. We have existed. There must be one moment in 24 hours when I say, my God, I didn't know this. Is that so? How did it happen? How can this be do done? So that is a necessary condition. Now, if you really ask me, what do we do? Well, monitor it. A change not monitored is a change not desired. A change not monitored is a change not desired. If you start, and all of you, my request is, if you start tracking this, in the last 24 hours, was, which was the moment when I felt, my God, I didn't know this. Because then that shows your ability to admit our ignorance. It creates humility. Humility creates hunger for new ideas. And that is a precursor of knowledge and learning. Once I start looking for ideas, I will find them. So I would say surprise is one necessary condition. And how do we institutionalize it? So this is an innovation playground. There are two dimensions to this playground, inside out and outside in. Inside out means, am I willing to share ideas with outside world? Outside in means, am I willing to learn ideas from outside? So there is a cell on the right hand side bottom, ostrich. Neither will I share, nor will I learn. I'm very happy the way I am, and leave me alone. Such companies, such organization, such teams are doomed. You won't even find them after a few years. They will disappear because they have an antidote. They have been immunized for innovation, against innovation, you know, vaccinated. So the moment innovative idea come, they will kill it. Such organizations, such teams will not go very far. But then there are some who have inside out low. They don't share much, but they're willing to take crowdsourcing. A lot of ideas, let it come. Johnson & Johnson and many other companies. They're like sponges. They will pay you some amount, $10,000 maybe, or one lakh rupees, but they won't tell you whether they made one crore or 10 crore or 100 crores out of that. So I, my confidence as a provider of idea doesn't go up because I don't know what value my idea had. I thought it had only 10,000 rupees of idea, only 20,000. But this is a very widespread model. You seek ideas, but don't share what you do with them. 
And I tell you, many organizations who start innovation systems, after some time they find nobody's giving their ideas because you don't tell them what you do with those ideas. So if you want to fail, the best remedy for failing in innovation movement in your company or organization is don't tell people what you do with their ideas. And you will very soon die, you will very soon find an obituary of innovation ecosystem in the company. Very simple, you don't have to do much. Just one act and your movement has failed, your attempt has failed. If you don't want that, you will have to tell people. Look at this, the third, pollinator. What do pollinators do? They don't need much because they are so ahead of others, but they want to share their ideas. So Tesla, famous company of electrical vehicles, they made all their patents on batteries open. Why would they do that? Others will copy? Of course others should copy because they wanted to have large number of charging stations for the electrical car and nobody will set up charging stations only for one model or one brand. So they wanted more people to come in the market. Can you imagine the, the big mindedness of such people? They wanting, they're creating competition. They want more people because they know by the time you catch up with what technology they have developed yesterday, they would have developed something new tomorrow. So they will be again on, away, always on the edge. But then they don't want the others should not learn from them. So they are pollinated. They share a lot. And this one, the, the one my favorite is Honeybee Network, some elements of Tesla. Dil bada, dimag bada. Those who want to learn more and share more. Dil bada, dimag bada. Now this is the approach we need in our companies, in our organizations, in our systems. But how will it happen? What is the indicator? I mentioned the change not monitored is the change not desired. So if I ask all of you, how, what is the, how many of you had upload to download ratio more than one? Please raise hands. In the last one month, how many of you had upload to download ratio more than one? One. Otherwise, we are a country of consumer of knowledge. Our download is more very much, our upload is very little. Isn't it true? A country, a society, an individual, a professional, which only downloads and does not upload cannot be a leader in the world. Please understand this. Nobody has become leader by only downloading. Please understand that. We have the world's biggest consumer of global knowledge, but we don't produce knowledge that global society will consume. How can we be leader then? Today, when you come to the grassroots innovations, you will not find 15,000, 20,000 open source database of innovations in the world. Nobody has even 200, 300. We have got 20,000 on our website in multiple languages. Because more we share, more people write to us and connect with us from all over the world, they will write to us. A person wrote from Switzerland, sir, I, had, I was facing a problem in my, uh, my garden, my home is on a slopey land and uh, I had a problem while moving my lawn mover. The lawn mover was slipping. The wheels were slipping on the wet grass. And I have done something. I didn't know who to tell, so I'm telling you. Can you imagine an IT professional working in Switzerland shares his innovation with me because he didn't know who to share it with. What was the innovation? He put the screws in the wheel of the lawn mover outward. So it became a spiked wheel. Now a spiked wheel can easily climb the lawn and do the job. Simple innovation. Nobody had invented a spiked wheel for a lawn mover before that. Now, what is our game? Because we shared, I'm getting knowledge from people who I don't know. That's the beauty of ecosystem, that if strangers share their creativity and knowledge with you, you become richer because you shared. If you didn't share, nobody would know who to go to. So my suggestion is that we must try to share as many ideas that we can, and please mind you, in any company, in any sector, there are some ideas which you can share without losing your competitive edge. In fact, future belongs to collaborative creativity. You know, ISRO launched one of the heaviest satellites yesterday. And I wrote in my tweet, I said, it is a tribute to collaborative innovation. It was not done by one person. It was not done only by ISRO scientists. A lot of scientists and a lot of institutions worked together to make the satellite go up in the sky. Now this is spirit is not as pervasive as it should be. And we therefore suffer. So please understand that if we really want to create an ecosystem, an innovation playground, then we have to move towards 
DBDB, which means we must, we must have the confidence that if others learn from us, our supply chain of ideas will not dry up. If I share, that means I will have to, to be original, I can have to come out with a new idea next time. There's a pressure on me to be more creative. Please understand, sharing creates pressure to be creative. You can't share the same thing over and over again. So very important. So look at this simple idea. All of you have refrigerators at your home. And I have asked this question in Harvard and MIT, wherever I go for lectures, I've asked this question. Look, all of you have refrigerators. Have you ever seen any company which makes refrigerators that use heat of the compressor? Compressor makes heat, produces heat. Is there any refrigerator that uses that heat? This kid did that. He just put a heat exchanger alongside the compressor, made a hot chamber on the top, but the water that was circulating became hot water. Hot water now creates a hot chamber. You can keep your food warm. So there's a hot chamber in the refrigerator. There's a cold chamber where you keep things cool. You get more work. And because compressor has to work less, less electricity consumption, you use less energy and get more work. This is frugality. This is frugal innovation model of India. This is what we want. We want to use less energy, less resources, and get more output. That's model that India has taught to everybody. Other day in my class, I was telling that, look, I, one of my uh, very passionate uh, interest is how to create open source, library of open source content for our children who study in government school. You know that today we produce two, class, two kinds of citizen. One who study in government school, they are second class citizen. Those who study in private schools are first class citizen. And this discrimination doesn't bother us because middle class has removed its children from the government schools. So none of you will be affected if government schools don't have any performance. They don't teach, children don't get any material, no. In my institute, which has students from IIT and other top institutions, 90% of the students come after coaching, 95%. Which means those children or students who can't afford tuition or coaching have no chance of reaching us. So what do we do for children who whose parents can't afford? So I wanted to create an open source library of multimedia, multi-language content for our children. We created some. Then I asked my students a question. I said, how do I deliver to those villages which don't have computers? So one student gave me an idea. He said, sir, have you not heard about OTG cable? I said, no, I have not heard about OTG cable. Sir, this can easily connect any disk to a smartphone. So this is what I got ultimately. It has USB drive on one side, micro USB on the other side. This has, a, this has data. It was copied from this drive. This will transmit, connect to any, micro, any smartphone, Android phone. And now a teacher in the government school can show experiments of science, can show the animation on Eclipse. Same way as the most privileged child gets taught, I'll be able to make it available for the government school ch child, thanks to that student who taught me that there is something called as this. I didn't know this, to be honest with you. Our kids are very smart. Now, digital technologies make it possible to overcome the asymmetry in access to knowledge, access to ideas, access to innovation. But are we using this for enough? And I would suggest that there are, there are ways in which such ideas can go to every slum, every community, if we can create consortium of open source content, open source content, and make it available to people at low cost and e easy manner. There are several exclusions that take place in our society. Innovations must be inclusive. Innovations must be inclusive. How do they become inclusive? If they can meet the needs of people in remote areas, difficult areas. If they can meet the need of the sectors where the productivity is low. For example, I'm wearing Khadi Kurta, so handloom. Khadi sector is the one which employs millions of people, but there has hardly been any innovation in that sector. So no productivity change. So people get very low wages. If I can improve innovations and induce innovation in that sector, wages go up. Tribal people in forest, not one gram of forest produce is valorized in forest. All of it comes out as raw material, and then you add value in cities or elsewhere. So the tribal person remains as a resource collector. He collects the forest produce. If we change that, their productivity will go up. So in situ value addition. There are certain seasons, flood, drought, when regions become difficult to access. 
social segment. We all know biases against certain social classes, certain skills. So how do we overcome these structural? There are sometimes criteria of governance which also militate against inclusion. So inclusive innovation must be those which are able to overcome various kinds of exclusion. Is it enough to be inclusive? No, it should be also extremely affordable, frugal. Is that enough? It should also be sustainable. Look at a one rupee sachet of shampoo or hair oil. Very frugal, isn't it? Very affordable, very inclusive. Poorest person can also afford it. Is it sustainable? Calculate the cost of collecting that piece of plastic from 650,000 villages of our country, you know how costly that innovation is. It's not sustainable. So we want sustainability, we want frugality, and we want inclusivity. Innovation must be inclusive, frugal, sustainable. All the three, then we are on a path that will take us forward. One of the driver of innovation is a beautiful word that we have, I'm sure, in Bangla, in Hindi, in Gujarati. Samvedana. <coughs> Sam means equal. Vedna means pain. When I feel the pain of someone as intensely as that person feels it, it doesn't remain that person's pain, it becomes my pain. Phir swanta hai sukhai ki bhavna se, main us dard ko kam karunga. Samvedna se, sarjan shilta. Creativity, now empathy is for others, so empathy is not the right translation for samvedna. There is no word in English exactly equal to samvedna. But for want of a better word, let us use empathy. So the empathetic innovations, innovations which overcome the pain of others and make me feel better. So I have done innovation not because I want to help that person. I want to reduce my pain. I'm suffering. I'm affected by that person's pain. That innovation becomes empathetic pain. A lot of good ideas, a lot of great innovations are evolved. They emerge from that feeling. When you feel, when you develop that solution, you didn't have that problem yourself, isn't it? You fix that there, there are people, you saw the problem, the people whose hand shakes, and therefore you invented that solution. So many times, good innovators, empathetic innovators, innovators who bring about change in society are very samvedanshil. They are very, they are, they have huge samvedana in their heart. They, are, they can feel the pain of others, and that drives this solution of, so let me give a few examples before I close and then summarize the lessons. We were walking, I'm going to Meghalaya tomorrow, so I'll be walking with my students for a week as a part of Shodhyatra. I have walked in every state of the country. Summer, we go to places which are hot. In winter, we go to the places which are cold. So we were in Nograt village where we saw this bridge. And we asked the people, why did you make such a bridge? We could have used any material, steel, iron, wood. Sir, we wanted to do something different, something sustainable. So then what happened? We saw the tre trees, of ficus, uh, trees of ficus, especially on both sides of the river. They had roots which are hanging. We thought they are, look like rope. Why don't we use them? So first culprit is culture. Culture which says we must do something different, something sustainable, something better. Can we create this culture in our organizations? I think we can. Because this is what this community has done. All right, so what happened next? Sir, next we found that these roots are like ropes. This is our material, so technology. But then we couldn't have made it alone, so we wanted group, that is institution. So technology is like word, institutions are like grammar, culture is like thesaurus. We need all the three for a viable ecosystem for innovation. You need to bring about change in the culture of the organization, you need to create institutions, rules, norms, values, which will help people to anticipate and cooperate, and you need to have a culture, and you need to have technologies which are inclusive, which are affordable, which are sustainable. Let me give another example in Purulia in West Bengal. We are, I am talking in Kolkata, so I must tell you this. And mind you, this lesson that I'm going to share with you, you will not find in any book of management. But our, our communities are so creative, they, can, they have evolved models that we have to learn from. So we were walking and we came across this tree having beautiful terracotta horses. So we asked the potters, why did you keep such terracotta, beautiful horses here? Somebody can break it, somebody can take it. Then by that time they knew I'm a professor. They said, Professor, you have done a mistake. I said, what mistake did I do? We have not kept the most beautiful ones. We have kept the best ones. Why did you keep the best ones? 
uh, when our children go to school in the morning through this way, they must see what is the best that communities can do. They must do better. Open source standards of excellence. This is what this culture teaches me. A small village in Purulia tells me that, sir, we want to push our children to do better than what we have done. I wish every company has that norm, every organization has that norm, where the younger team must be challenged, must be pushed to do better than what we have done. And we must be honest and humble enough to admit that, look, I didn't know what you're telling me. I didn't know that OTG cable exists. I didn't know that this data can be transferred to mobile phone. I didn't know that. Why should, what is the wrong in admitting that? I mean, all of us wish our younger generation to be smarter, to be more sensitive, to be more some wisdom shield. So we must acknowledge our in ignorance, our, in our inability to solve problems. And this is what this community of potters taught me in Purulia. And I'm sure if this lesson can go to every organization, this country will be different. So there are four levels at which we learn from innovation at artifactual level, at analogic level, heuristic level, and just all. When you look at innovation, don't think whether this is of use to me. Don't think that whether this shoe will be of interest to me or not. Think of the principle underlying it. Think of metaphorical meaning in this innovation. Can this trigger some innovation in my mind? So I was telling that if you started a column today, no newspaper has, and I must say this, I must say Mahapatra this thing. No newspaper has even four inch column every day on innovation. No newspaper has even four inch column on innovation every day. I want to say this publicly. What do we mean? We, have, we think this country wants to be innovative. You have comic strips, you have cartoons, fixed places for them, but you have no fixed place for a column on innovation. One corner, just one corner so that those who are creative will open the newspaper and look at that corner. What is new today? Isn't it? Uh, my day should begin with a new thought. First message I should get in my WhatsApp group should be of some problem that somebody has solved through their own genius. That obsession we want to create. So innovation must be seen not just in artifactual term, whether this exactly idea is of use. Look at what is that person trying to do? Can I do something different? Can I apply it in some other sector? China did that. China was not able to produce so many solutions, but they were able to apply existing solutions to new domains, new sectors. That's why they did so well. This is a very simple idea. A lot of variations on same innovation. Motorcycle-based plowing machine in Gujarat, Amreli, Magan Mansur Bhai Jagani created it. Now you can have so many variations of that. It can move on the crop. It can move various places. We transfer this technology to Kenya. This must be, you must remember this. Do you remember this? Do you remember this scooter? In Three Idiot? Now look at that. It was hardly about a couple of minutes in that film, right? Three hour film, there were only a couple of minutes when she goes and spanks that hero on that scooter. Everybody remembers this. This is the power of media. This is the power you have in your hand, all of you. You can make people remember a few seconds, few minutes, forever. Millions of people in so many countries remember this scene. This incidentally is Jahangir, whom we had it recognized with a consideration award for this. He's an innovator that Honeybee Network found out. So what I'm saying is that you have a power in your hand. You can make people remember things. You can make people inspired by the ability to communicate these ideas in a manner that nobody has done it before. And please remember, if the whole world is become visual. You know, today, we had an age when we used to write everything on Bhojpatras and uh, copper plate, tambar patra, et cetera, isn't it? So that was a culture at the time when it wrote everything. Then came Shruti culture. We don't want to write, we want to hear. Now came visual culture. I don't want to write, I put an emoji. Huh? Just an image, I don't want to write. I don't, what the time is spent, I'm feeling awful. I, to write, I'm feeling awful, just put a face there. This is the age of current. This is how we started. 25,000 years ago in Bimbeteka caves, people made some art before civilization evolved, and we can interpret that art exactly as that was made 25,000 years ago. So if that can be done, if this is the way we are moving, why can't we make our communication system more visual and graphic? So let me just come to the last point before I close, because this is time to close, and I would not take much time. So let me, yes, yes, I'm this way. So I must, uh, we organize various kinds of innovations. So I would suggest four things to be done by every company. Search innovation, spread innovation, 
celebrate innovation and sense the unmet need. In your own domain, find out the problems which have remained unaddressed. And then we are able to create this triangle and we'll be able to go to the area where we will have great movement, creativity counts, knowledge matters, innovations transform, incentives inspire, but not just material incentives, also non-material incentives, not just individual incentives, but also collective incentives. Thank you so much. See, these days when you talk about digital transformation, it's a very, very challenging preposition. And the gentleman who just spoke before me has just compounded my issues, right? Such a profound uh, dialogue. You know, before we get set up here, I've been told that I have very little time by Kalida and I need to finish everything that I need to finish very fast, right? So without any major foreplay here, I'll get straight into what I want to talk and whilst they're setting it up, I'll start my dialogue. So let me, so the attempt here is to talk about digital transformation. There is a lot of deluge of data around digital transformation. Uh, in the literature that you read, what you download, like the professor just said, there is enough information you have on digital transformation. So it's very difficult to get any key takeaways from such dialogue. So I'll attempt, if I can attempt in the next 20 minutes to tell you one or two things about this, this disruptive phenomenon that's happening in our marketplace and talk a little bit about Crayon and you take one or two key takeaways, I think that's a job good, well done. So let me begin right at the top, right? I am quoting from PwC survey. For CEOs today, the biggest trend that they believe will shape their entire business is technology. If they look at technology, they are looking at inductive massive dollops of emerging technology to usher in the new, new growth, new profitability, new markets and so on and so forth. What they are really looking at are meshed IT strategy where they can seamlessly integrate the old with the new because that's what our enterprises are all about. When they look at digital transformation, the key challenge that each of the CEOs have today is how do I create a vision for this transformation? Why do I say that there is a need to change? And how do I make sure that my business leaders are buying into this vision? And then of course the whole cultural transformation where everybody in the organization are aligning to my vision. And then the most important thing is the skill set that is required, both hard digital skill set and the soft digital skill set to make this successful. And by soft digital skill set, I mean this whole thing about collaboration, problem solving, customer centricity, and so on and so forth. IT plays a key role here because what the CEO is expecting today is that IT is moving from a predominantly back office focused function to a very front focused innovation led kind of a phenomenon, which is essentially where CIOs come into the picture. And we are set up by now. Does this work? Yeah. So the disclaimer is, I am not talking about the capabilities or doubting the capabilities of people in this room. But essentially, traditional ways of doing IT are sunsetting. And what's happening is there are radical methods driven by on-demand computing, which is defining the IT taxonomy and our consumption pattern. The CIO is at the intersection of this major disruption, and for him it is important to do two things. One, balance between operational excellence and business innovation. Two, become a good leader in business knowledge, business process outsourcing, functional expertise, and on the other hand, emerging technologies, existing technology, and people managerial skills, right? It is important when CIOs look at their business today that I do not run the risk of IT being called as a cost center because that's where I will completely demolish the whole perception of being a business enabler. And how can I then drive IT as a profit center by defining an enterprise, IT enterprise, which is driving outcomes like business growth, profitability, and so on and so, so forth. So there is a chasm that you need to now cross from being in the traditional mode to the modern mode. 
and what it means that you need to learn, unlearn, be agile. And where the CIO or the technology leader is also a very strong business leader, you will typically see that these transformation stories in your organizations will have you at the table with the CEO and the CEO. Otherwise, you are leaving room for someone who is more business-centric, like a chief digital officer, to be entering your space, so-called. So to quickly summarize, where is IT moving from? Predominantly back, back office fo function focused. Support function, I remember I used to get calls. I'm 25 years in this industry. CIOs used to call me to say, my CEO's laptop is down, he's at the airport, CIOs. That moved now to an era where it was a more an enabler between the business and IT. Then to an era which I call the true stepping stone for digital transformation, which is called the bimodal mode. What that means is, on one hand, you have a predictable part of your IT environment, which is well understood, which you need to optimize and renovate. And you have an exploratory phase where you need to experiment to do new things to solve problems, right? And when you do that, you are truly embarking to become an agile CEO, CIO. So then what is digital transformation? And I downloaded and I downloaded and I downloaded consultants, academia, analysts, and I got 10,000 different definitions of digital transformation. The fact of the matter is there is no one size fits all here. Different interpretation of, of the transformation by different industries, and I'll give you an example. If you are an asset heavy industry like manufacturing, you will typically use digital transformation to drive an inside operational excellence driven transformation story. You know, where essentially you're talking of things like IoT to drive excellence in your operational excellence. If you are a B2C enterprise, finance, transport, retail, you are typically looking at digital transformation to drive a very rich customer experience, right? DevOps, AI, all of these technologies come to the floor. There's another way of looking at it and that's very, very important and that's the major takeaway for my talk today is this whole thing about an enterprise-led stack and an internet-led stack. So in the enterprise-led stack, which is what most of us would have, this digital transformation is piecemeal, process by process, function by function. How do I do, how do I digitize my HRMS solution? How do I digitize, you know, my collaboration with my suppliers? Internet-led stacks are more the new age companies who are building platforms, so to say, to completely disrupt the industries. What's common to all of these guys is the use of technology, defining new products, disrupting industries, creating great customer experience, and also developing they are, you know, streamlining the operations. So what is this digital transformation today? It needs to have three capabilities. Whether you are enterprise-led and or an internet-led stack, there are three capabilities that you should deliver. The first one is redefine the process, redefine the products, and streamline your operations. Millions of devices entering online those mobile devices where we are all connected, the need for instant gratification, it's so huge that people want everything to be done at the speed of thought, right? And they want to have, to do, to be able to do this by delivering great customer experience. Accenture study says 60% of us consumers switch providers if they do not get the right customer experience. And that number is going to accentuate to 90%. So customer experience is, is paramount. Take a great example. It's the easiest example is Ola, right? We used to go to the roads, hail a cab, go on to our destination. Today we are sitting in the living rooms at the click of a few buttons. We know where we want to go, how much time it is going to take, what cab, how much money, who is the driver, which is the cab, what are the coupons available, everything. Great customer experience. A few weeks back, Ola Uber was on strike in Mumbai. Even old timers like us completely forgot how to do our transportation. You know, it was as if the life has come to a standstill. And how many years have Ola and Uber been with us? Few years. How many years is the Kalipili in Mumbai? Several years. Complete different customer experience. And then the third important thing is this whole phenomenon of employee empowerment, retention of talent, right? This all relates to automation enterprise level stacks. Old wine, new bottle. In our industry, it's always old wine, new bottle. By the way, different things come in different ways as you go forward, right? And 
a Gallup study says that there's a direct correlation between employee share, the, the earnings per, per share and the dissatisfaction of your, of your employees. So it's important that you really look at how you are retaining talent. HRIMS solution is a great example. Your financial documents, expense claims, leaves, your performance reviews, everything automated. Great efficiency at the customer level. Uh, whoops. Seems to have got stuck. Okay. What I just want to spend the next four slides is, I've been selling for 25 years. I've been hearing about the cloud for the last 15 to 20 years. Today, it is real. Last one year, I have not visited any CIO or CEO who has not spoken about digital transformation. So forget about the numbers. I really don't know what's happening here. But in the next few years, everything in terms of your IT spend will start moving to the cloud. Infrastructure definitely will start moving to the cloud. It will intrinsically become more elastic, more, more containerized, more virtualized, more self-serving, more self-monitoring, and so on and so forth you will begin to see a huge spend on the cloud. Your, what's happening? Your, your data centers, which were holding your, you know, all of your infrastructure and application will slowly start begin phased out. You start to move to the public cloud or the hybrid cloud, and what will stay within our old hosting systems. So essentially, you will come to, a, to an era where you will see the flip of, your innovation versus maintenance, right? We used to talk about innovation versus maintenance, 80% maintenance, 20% innovation. And this whole phenomenon is going to get now flipped because what's going to happen is most of the cost and complexity of your environment are going to be taken by the cloud providers. Can somebody fix this, please? Is there somebody who can fix this? Okay. Yeah, be there, don't worry. Just be there, okay. So the cloud will take over the compl complexity. Cloud solution will re-engineer the entire IT policies that you have. And essentially, CIOs will have the bandwidth now to start looking at how do I do things like gaining share, new products, new markets, and so on and so forth. The other very important phenomenon is this whole confluence or convergence of technologies that are all happening at the same time. Cloud, multi -mil millions of users going online. 460 plus internet users, 4G LTE, 5G going on. The entire government thinks around digital India, startup India, makeup India, digital lockers. And you will see that we are in an environment which is brimming with digital enterprise all across us. Right? It means that this is something which is real. This is something which is going to stay. Of course, AI is still very, very native, right? It is still you know, the expectation from an AI solution is very utopian at this point in time, and AI does not have the capability to, to drive those kind of results. Similarly, with blockchain, you see the, the, the most popular cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, has actually gone down in the last 12 months. But despite that, despite all of this, despite the clones of, of Bitcoin, despite the fact that Bitcoin is used for some dark enterprise like drugs, this is a phenomenon because applications have been built on the blockchain technology. And this is, is real. This transformation is real. And for all of the technology leaders in the room, it means there is a shift. There's a slow shift from being a historical CIO, moving to a digital CIO. Where you were a one-time problem solver, today you are an integrator of services. You're going to build the digital stack on top of your legacy technology and integrate both of them. Right? So you're becoming an integrator of services. From keeping the lights on, you are now becoming a leader of agility because you are driving a culture within the enterprise where you want to basically get enterprise products and services in the culture of agility within the organization. From managing large, complex, one-time projects, which is how you were looking at problems, and the professor spoke about frugality, you are now becoming a disruptor because essentially you are becoming a frugal modernizer as you're using the digital methods and technology to reduce the cost of processes that will self-fund this transformation. And then from a builder in the good old days, any problems, you build a solution to solve the problem. You are moving from a builder to a utility model. 
right? The old complex systems, which were more systems of record, ERP, CRM, very robust, very scalable, but release is measured in years. You are moving to a system of engagement where user experience is, is paramount importance, where the releases are measured not in weeks, but sometimes in days. And that, that essentially means you need to start moving from a building model to a model of, of utility, subscription-based. But the most important is this whole phenomenon of aspiring leadership to a prominent leadership. I was part of CIO events 10 years back, and if there are CIOs in this room, the talk on the floor was CIO stands for career is over. I am not kidding you. This was what they used to say, career is over. Now, with all this opportunity that is presented by this, by this the great phenomenon that's happening, there is a chance for you to become a prominent leader. Develop the command skill to say, I have a process, I have a solution, I have a technology that is going to disrupt the way we are going to do business, which means you need to go and take all your stakeholders along with you, cost, CFO, people, HR, business leaders for the change in, in the business model, the CEO. It's a great opportunity to become a prominent leader. And that is why this digital transformation is very, very personal to each one of us. And you would have realized that I've spoken for quite some time, but I haven't spoken about Kiran at all, right? And that's, this is where I'll talk a little bit about Kiran. I'm not going to talk a lot about it. So when you essentially, when the rubber hits the road, you are looking at a product, an app, a solution, a process that needs to be digitized. Or you need to start a process because that's about your market. That's about your differentiation. That's about what you want to do. And we spoke about innovation. That when you have innovation, you need those connections. I mean, if there are no connections, these technology leaders can't really do anything. So we are a Norwegian company, 40 plus cities, 20 plus countries. We work with thousands of ISVs. In India, I work with more than 100 ISVs. Great solutions of different verticals. And I help enterprises. One, I help the ISVs go to market, but I also help enterprises build solutions with those ISV solutions. Once you decide what you wanted to do, what's your next step? How will I get it delivered? How am I going to get this solution delivered? And we remember we spoke about from build to subscribe, how you deliver that solution is basically what your profitability is all about. Your scalability, your market share gains. And it is important you have a partner who will work with you to help you serve that solution because it needs a, it's a new wrap on the applications and several other things. You need to move the infra perhaps from on-prem to hybrid or a public cloud provider environment, right? So we help you there. And then once you're in the cloud, irrespective of what all of you think, it needs to get optimized. And I'll give an example. If you are a platform-based company, statistics will tell you there, are, there can be only two platforms at any point in time which can stay competitive in a market. And you can look around the different digital organizations around to, to prove this. Because what happens is when you start a platform, you initially start by throwing people and, and money at the problems. There comes a time in the life cycle of that platform where attaining additional customers becomes more expensive. And hence you need to optimize it, optimize the entire infrastructure and so on and so forth. So our cloud desk, our cloud architects, our data scientists help you do that. Essentially we manage this for you. So from your from a different vector, when you look at it, it's all about creating value, going digital, transforming capabilities. It's also about managing your, your legacy and optimizing your legacy infrastructure, minimizing this. This is the bimodal IT. And how we do that? I can't talk digital if I'm not myself digital. So our answer is the intelligent cloud, which is a series of seven portals. This is the life cycle management for everybody who wants to go on the cloud. From the time you come in, we optimize your entire software estate. We are the only ones who do GDPR for you. And we do this end to end. From the time you go on the cloud, the migration, the POC, the optimization to cloud managing it for you, we do everything. I want to summarize this for you. And you'll need to give me two minutes. There were too many glitches here, so you need to give me two minutes. This I call the ABCD of digital transformation. The first one is the architecture. And the B is the business. The A is architecture, the B is business. And the both go hand in hand. When you are talking at the architecture, we look at two vectors. One is infrastructure, one is application. If you look at 
enterprise stack, I'll call it the E stack, and this I'll call the I stack. The E stack is largely private cloud or internal data center, where you essentially build, bought a lot of hardware, cut out VMs, and run the VM storage and everything on the VM. This is the classical way of doing things. The internet-based companies, the I stack, it's largely public oriented. Look at the application. If you look at the enterprise, which most of us are, okay, this is COTS, capabilities of the shelf, modification of the shelf. We buy software which is easier to manage. Whereas on, on this side of the table, on the application side, when you are an I stack, it is all about the SaaS based models. How can you use open source to build this kind of a technology? Essentially, when you're building an architecture, you need to be able to straddle the balance between an E stack to an I stack. Most of the COTS player are anyway going the subscription way. Licensing is going pay as you go, pay as you drink, whatever, whatever, whatever. So the whole phenomenon is how do I move my I stack to my, is my E stack to my I stack. So essentially going the cloud, the cloud stack way. Cost becomes important. That's the, that's the C of digital transformation. Because if every time you do a transformation and a change request hits a big cost to the businesses, there is going to be a natural friction. So how do you build elasticity in the cost? How do you reframe the cost model? How do I use AI to streamline operations becomes important. And the last is delivery. There are often many times IT will say project delivered, I am in green. Business will say outcome not delivered, I am not happy. So you need to have a holistic view of this entire delivery model so that IT delivers the outcome that has been desired. Otherwise, it is called operation successful, patient died. Right? So with that note, and of course you need to have the security framework to go all of, to, to be able to, you know, sustain this kind of a growth. I'm sorry I had to rush through, but I hope you thought this was useful and you had some key takeaways. I thank you for your time and I, I wish you a great conference and a great evening. Thank you. Yeah, good evening and uh, I'm quite mindful that the whole session is uh, behind by only one hour. So I'll try to keep it brief and uh, concise and thank you for the very rapid fire introduction. It almost sounded like an advertisement on an FM, FM show. <laughs> but uh, I understand, you know, the the constraints for the time, so let me jump right in to the topic of the day. I can see, I actually I feel quite at home because I can see quite a few of my ATC colleagues here. Thank you for coming over here, but for the rest, let me tell you, there's no, you know, instruction from the boss to be here, but thanks a lot for being here. Okay, digital disruptions in um, FMCG, that's the topic of the day, and um, I mean, uh, we all aware we are in the digital age, I mean, a lot of things are changing. And if you go back 10 years, there have been so many things which are not there, uh, which we take it for granted today. And one of them being, you know, the ubiquitous mobile. The terminology that we are talking, I'm sure all of you must be hearing from the, since the morning, the AI, the ML, the ARs, the VRs, the blockchains, and so many other technologies. None of them were there 10 years back. And so was the consumer's life. I mean, we were all consumers who are in this room. And if you just reflect back, 10 years back, what we were doing, and um, I'm pretty sure that uh, the way we shop, the way we live, the way we entertained ourselves, the way we ordered food or local transportation, everything was so, so, so different. So having said that, you know, that was 10 years back. Now if you just fast forward yourself, you know, put your mind in, friend. Just imagine the opportunities. It's not the question of awakening the demon, but uh, like any technology, it all depends on how you harness the, the power and potential of the technology for what purpose that you are applying it for. So let's look at uh, uh, what's happening on the, in the consumer side, because that's key for in FMCG sector, because it's customer centricity is something that which is a mantra which everyone lives by. Uh, maybe I, I don't know at the back, you can read the slides, but I will not, it's a busy slide, I will not go through in detail, but I want to point out few things which are very, very important for us to understand uh, the topic. If you look at this, uh, oh, this I can, if you look at the lower right hand uh, bottom, by 2020, 2025, it is expected that 42% of Indian population will be millennials. That is half of uh, 
Indians will be millennials. They are born after 95, 20 or whatever. I mean, these are digital natives. They are born and are comfortable using technology for whatever they do. And they are going to be the consumers and they are going to be your target groups if you are anyone who is in the FMCG space. Uh, we all know the in terms of the mobile penetration is almost reaching 90% now. Smartphones are with more than 70% people. And uh, internet usage just below 35 years age as of now is about 72%. So uh, that's the bottom line. Within five to seven years, almost half of all consumers will be young millennials. And the way they're going to expect things to be delivered to them are completely different from what we are all used to at this point in time. Uh, yeah. So I want to simplify the whole thing. I mean, you know, when we talk about industry strategy and everything, I mean, there's so many things that comes. And uh, uh, so for the purpose of today's discussion, I want to point out, and my argument is around this, that the FMCG industry success is built around three pillars. I mean, very simple, actually. The first one is how you build the brands. And this was a classical sense. This is how FMCG industry got built over 70 years. Right? You build a great brand. And uh, brand is something you can, you know, in your, if I tell you a soap, each one of you in your mind can see a soap, but are actually a brand. Right? Probably one you use or one you want to aspire to use. Uh, it'll have a great imagery. It'll talk about dreams. It'll talk about the experiences that you can have by possessing that, uh, that particular product or using that product. Whether it could be a soap, it could be a detergent, it could be a home care, personal care, what have you. Right? And the second one, or second pillar on which FMCG is built is about the mass standardization a mass manufacture of a standardized product, which is you make once, and then you make it billion times. That's where you get the economies of scale. That's where you get all the leadership in, in the market in terms of cost advantages, in terms of innovation, everything. You just do once and then make it billion times. An example, you, you think of a beverage, right? You're, you are thirsty, you, it's summer, and you want a, a cold beverage. You can think, I mean, you can, the choice of brands are very few there. Maybe a couple of them, but it's just mass manufactured, one standardized product made day after day for years together in a standardized technology, right? Um, as somebody put it, like if you look at the numbers, I mean, take the case of a beverage, uh, amount of a beverage is consumed. If you put all the bottles next to each other, it'll suckle the earth, but it's same product, right? That's the classical FMCG industry. That's how it was built. And the third, a very important thing about FMCG, because FMCG stands for fast-moving consumer good, right? Which is basically means that that is a product that you buy most of the time. Therefore, it is it has to be available to you when you want it. So distribution is another successful mantra behind FMCG industry, which is uh, within the arm's length. So when you want it, when there is a need, it's available to you. So you, basically, these are the three. I mean, there could be many other. I'm just trying to simplify for our discussion today. Uh, these are the three core principles. If you get these three right, uh, you could have you know, uh, been successful almost 90% of it. Those of you who are not millennials, you can actually reflect again some of the brands, iconic brands built. They were built around. For example, I'll give you Nirma. Right? Those of you who in the 80s, 90s, when the brand got built, Great brand built on the brand building done on TV, mass manufactured standardized product, available at every nook and corner, even in rural outlets. That's how the product got built, and a huge industry got, huge company got built. So now, uh, moving forward, so how is, where is digital fits in? If you look at now, the whole classical FMCG successful paradigm has changed completely, because Digital is disrupting every aspect of these three pillars, right? Let's take the first one, the power to build a, a, a the brand building exercise. The earlier classical, what was the, what was the case? You make a great jingle, great uh, ad, and show it 100 times on the TV, especially around probably a, a, a cricket match in India or, uh, or whatever, you know, which is very popular. But today, you can't succeed with that. You, because, People are not there. The millennials are not on TV. 
they're not watching TV anymore. Statistics show that 75% of the millennials are actually watching more uh, online, online uh, stuff than the TV. So you have to be there where they are. And they are in all these social channels, right? I mean, we have on top of them. And the first two account almost 80% of viewership. So very interestingly, the digital help now or digital uh, disruption in the way you build brands is total. Because if you have to reach your consumers today, you can't just say that I'll build once, make one great ad, show it 100 times, and then succeed. No. You have to go where your consumer is, right? Uh, and another important point is that the whole interaction has become two-way now. So earlier, it was one way. I mean, you watch TV, you watch an ad, and then you make your impression. And then you make your decision whether to buy that or use that product. No longer. Today, people are actually interacting with the brands on the social channels. So you have to provide a two-way interface systems. And this is where the power of digital is coming in. So digital is enabling FMCG to know who the consumer is, connect with the consumer on a one-to-one -one basis in the context of a consumer journey. Like say it's a birthday or it could be a wedding anniversary. You can have a different kind of conversation and convert those conversations into earning a right to be a part of the consumer's life. So that's the power of digital uh, in, 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 in the context of FMCG. And it's very, very, very important for FMCGs to, uh, to recognize that and, and make it a part of uh, their process. So this is about brands are now uh, made democratic, meaning people are now no longer saying that you offer me something which you think is right, they're not saying, you know, I want something which I feel right, right? That, that is the kind of power of connect digital is enabling the FMCG brands. The other aspect is uh, with the digital. There's a huge disruption again. I mentioned already that about 75% of the viewership is now on online. And um, you can see that two thirds of the TV reach in um, urban area is already covered by digital video. And very importantly, digital is enabling the vernacular uh, you know, it's no longer English is the lingua franca of, uh, you know, digital anymore. The, you can see the, you know, some statistics there. There's a 10x growth in terms of people searching in vernacular, their own language, right? And, um, and the Hindi content consumption on websites is increasing by 500%, right? So now see the possibilities of any new entrant of ability to connect to the people on one-to-one -one in a language of that person and ability to engage her to understand her aspirations and needs and then able to offer a communication. So this is the one huge disruption which digital has brought in in FMCG. So digital marketing, digital engagement, connected consumer, these are all the new buzzwords which are coming in now. And they can only get more and more deeper and leading to a one-to-one -one engagement with uh, in terms of the building brands. So let me look at the other part. The, I talked about standardized mass manufacturing uh, of uh, FMCG. So this is where the, uh, the whole, whole new digital technologies come in, which is the, uh, these, the umbrella of technologies under industry 4.0. So you would have heard again the all along entire day, right? You know, the 3D printers, the robotics, the data sciences. How are they coming in and helping the uh, reimagining FMCG. Uh, I'll give you an example, right? Uh, for example, uh, you know, product innovation. So I talked about mass manufactured standardized earlier. Now today, if you see uh, an example, and I, I want to take an example of say, uh, uh, biscuits, uh, cookies, right? You can actually today understand what are the regional preferences even to the micro market. I mean, I can actually, you know, in, in theoretical terms, we can actually go down to a granularity of even at a street level in a city and, can, and have an ability to offer a personalized, localized product at different points in different market. That's the power of, you know, digital technologies. And with the 3D printing kind of technologies developed, uh, you can actually take it to a next level, right? Uh, with combining data sciences, and combining ability to manufacture and deliver it locally into near your place, uh, we can actually 
custom build products smcg products also and deliver to your homes or wherever you are at the time you want and the third one uh, is obviously the distribution part uh, now we are all familiar here right earlier you want to buy you have to you have to go to uh, a shop or a go to a store right take out your car or vehicle and then go there fight the parking and and then get your shopping done today everything is available at a click and it's only growing today organized uh, e-commerce or e-commerce is at less than about 5 to 7% of the overall retail but that's increasing at a at a rapid rate in con in a cities like bangalore uh, the penet the penetration of uh, online grocery chains is more than 20% right that's one in five buy from one of the you know names that are there on the slide so rise in mobiles digital wallets uh, increase in consumer spending because of increasing wealth targeted promotions discounts targeting off offers uh, is going to create a golden period for fmcg and unless you know the fmcg's companies look at harnessing digital in some of these three pillars which i talked about earlier uh, are going to have a challenge because that's where the uh, you know the area of competition going to be going forward just to recap one is the the way you connect with consumer for the purpose of the building the brand the second is in terms of uh, product innovation and delivering product contextualized for you and and the third is the distribution and available making it available wherever you want and whenever you want so other parts of technologies are also i you know i got an opportunity but i had to cover them because each one of them have got a uh, a huge uh, you know impact on uh, on the whole value chain the ai there will be more and more ai assistants i am starting from consumer you heard in the previous session people talking about alexas and series etc uh today they are only helping people to uh, search for news tell you the time or probably the music right uh, very soon they will also be helping you ordering what you want for example you're feeling hungry you may say alexa get me a cookie and alexa may find maybe like, let me change the example everybody is talking about alexa let me talk about siri i'm not plugging for alexa anyway here right uh it may check what is in your refrigerator or what is there in your as an inventory in your in your house and possibly ask you can i order on your behalf right and uh, when it orders what will it order as an fmcg market you know manufacturer i want alexa to order my brand right so how do i market it to alexa so tomorrow brand building not necessarily mean that you know we have to appeal to consumers but also at some level probably we also need to have uh, target alexas and series and google homes of the world to so that you know they become brand loyal to what you have to you know uh, uh, i have to offer then a variety of you know computer analytics image analysis analytics etc will help in digital merchandising i talked about mobile wallets digital payments robotic process automation already talked about in earlier sessions going to make the lot of complex tasks much more simpler and faster cloud apps are going to help people get connected and iot led fleet tracking etc will go will, will give you a huge uh, delivery visibility to ensure the promises that you are going to make in delivering the our brands to consumers so let me uh, uh, you know uh, after all that you know also talk about on the business what's happening right i mean uh, the names Uh, just take it for as example it's not uh, for illustration only but how if you look at it uh, each one of them are started with one core business and they are entering every every sector today every sector is uh, quite uh, 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 you know seized with when will amazon enter their the their own you know business sector and when it does and they have the ability to do so because they know all about you they have the data right and um, 
and they have to connect with you because you have an account there. And I mean, it applies to the same thing, Apple and Google also. It's not just, I'm using Amazon as an example, right? Then just imagine, you know, they can, as I said earlier, I know that you probably have a, your, where do you work? What is your fitness regime? What do you like? And uh, even I can make stuff for you and get it delivered to you in a box when you want it or when you, when you need it, not even when you want it and charge based on you, based on your consumption. Because I know all about you, right? So for FMCG sector, again, those who are in FMCG, you need to really be cautious in terms of, uh, and need to rethink your own uh, uh, strategies of how you're going to apply technology, right? Uh, because the competition may not be the competition that you find today in your industry. There can be a whole new competition that could be coming in from outside and uh, who have the ability to uh, do all the first three things that I talked about in a much, much smarter and uh, profitable way. So with that, uh, let me conclude here uh, because again, this is one slide, typical management slide here because the technology can, can help improve productivity and efficiency across the entire chain that is from managing products, managing the sourcing procurements, I4, I talked about industry 4.0, managing the very, very complex supply chains um, and uh, enabling the direct to consumer, right? But what is more important is that today there's an opportunity to use these digital technologies for totally reimagining how FMCG can, industry can operate. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you for a patient hearing. Good evening to all of you, uh, eminent guests, and I hope you've, uh, you're enjoying yourself today in this uh, very historic and um, extremely informative conference where, of course, I've been associated for many years now. And uh, you've probably seen a lot of very interesting talks today uh, and a lot of talks which focus on the developments in technology in the future. Uh, I'm not going to be so futuristic as a lot of the other speakers, uh, largely because uh, this uh, particular topic that, I'm, that, uh, that we are talking about here is uh, something which is currently already uh, very much on the cards and on the table. But I do want to talk about what are the implications of this growing arena uh, to both businesses and societies and to individuals. Uh, the area, of course, is AI, which all of us know is... Uh, expanding very fast around the world in, tech, in uh, the corporate sector, in the consumer space, uh, in governments as well. Uh, but the whole question uh, arises is, how is this whole movement happening? Everyone's saying that this is a transformation. Uh, but the question is that, is it really a transformation in the way, let's say, uh, we saw a transformation in the past, which was, let's say, in the automobile industry, when it first came about in the early uh, 1920s or the television industry? Is it socially transformative? Or is it transformative more at the level of, uh, at the, level of the bottom line? Uh, and that's what I think we'll, I want to really talk about a little bit. Um, before I, I start, I just have a quick question is, uh, does anyone know the name of this particular painting or who created this painting, which was recently auctioned uh, in uh, October by Christie's, the famous auction house. And it was auctioned for about roughly $450,000. Does anyone know the artist who actually, uh, who actually created it? And this is coming uh, from my background uh, as a quizzing aficionado, but, <laughs> but I trust you, it has everything to do with this topic. Okay. It was not a human. It's an AI algorithm that created this painting. Uh, and this was auctioned just a few months ago, actually. This is the name of the artist, as I, as I wrote it down, the algorithm uh, name. So, you know, when you see this, you can imagine Christie's legendary auction house, you know, buying and selling paintings of legendary artists 
they auctioned this painting. Someone paid $430,000, obviously, over there. So you can see that the future is quite scary because if something as human and as um, profoundly social as art can be actually created by AI, and I'm talking about not just, uh, you know, not just, I mean, um, in terms of the analysis, but actually physically creating a painting, then imagine what could happen to uh, other activities, you know, that human beings actually do. So, and firstly, even if that does happen, the, 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 the other, you know, the, the more disturbing question is, is that a good thing or a bad thing? That in itself is another question. So the question that arises is, is about AI, is will it supplant human intelligence? That will it replace it? Or will it complement it? If you see that today, the way, uh, the, the, the level at which uh, it's currently at, that several tasks which are considered to be routine and um, drudgery for that matter, like for example, back office jobs, customer service, data processing, where you needed a lot of people, a lot of arms and legs on, uh, you know, in, in, inside the office. You see that those are getting gradually automated. First, what happened was that they went from being done directly in the country of origin of the company, like in the first world countries, it went into, say, developing countries like in India and in Philippines, um, and then gradually, uh, even that's as the costs are going, uh, you know, as the costs over here are getting higher for, for these jobs. Uh, instead of going further into, let's say, even cheaper territories, uh, companies are now finding it to be more attractive to automate the whole thing entirely through AI, which means that what happens to this entire industry that employs thousands of people around the world to service um, basic requirements such as taking off calls, customer service, or payroll, accounting. There are so many thousands and thousands of people. All of a sudden, there's a possibility that, you know, all those jobs can get automated. So what happens to all these people that are working there? What happens to their future? What happens to the livelihood? It's a huge question that is, that is currently being raised in society today, and there's really no clear-cut answer. Um, now, my view is that this is a tremendous disruption because society is not prepared for it, obviously, right? This transition of labor, um, which is uh, happening from, uh, you know, through technology. And um, my, my assessment is that there is, a, there is basically a layer of analysis of data and interpretation, which is still required, a human mind, to look at the data and to come up with trends and insights. You might still use technology to to actually delve deep into it, but at the core, there's still a requirement for human, in, uh, human intelligence. But, as you can see from the painting which I showed you, where such a creative and profoundly uh, insightful sort of a work can get automated, the question is that is it possible that even data analysis and interpretation, where for which you would need, let's say, a manager or uh, you know, um, uh, a senior executive or a specialized person, could even that be automated in the future, technically speaking? And you know, I actually spoke to some, uh, some experts and they actually said theoretically the way it works is, the way AI works is that it learns essentially from uh, patterns of, uh, of data that, that emerge from around it. And the way it learns is it's, it learns through algorithms which it runs on it. So the more sophisticated the algorithms and the more richer the data, in theory, the AI can learn tremendously and come up with better and better insights and interpretations of, of what uh, the solutions can be. So technically speaking, even this uh, it, it can get automated, but it may not get automated in the immediate term. It might take a while for that to happen, uh, but it definitely isn't within the realm of possibility. Now, the one area where it is less likely, unless robotics and um, you know, other technologies come in, uh, you know, develop faster, is services which involve physical contact and touch and feel those will continue to require the human element in that sense. So for example, when you're going to get a haircut, when you're going to, uh, let's say, uh, go to, um, uh, maybe go to a grocery, and uh, you know, um, uh, we go to, let's say, physically you go to a bank, uh, into a bank, and you sit with someone and discuss a mutual, uh, mutual fund, where anything where it requires interpersonal contact, that probably, uh, that interpersonal human element will not go away in a hurry. That will continue to remain. But the question is, what kind of value will those, will those professions hold? 
it's of course, uh, you know, uh, it's a question that cannot be answered at this point of time. And finally, the other, uh, the other issue is um, the qualities which will continue to be human domains in the future are things like imagination, for example, imagination, vision, where, you know, where you're looking at the future, where, you're, where you actually are looking at creating something. Empathy, which is more about how uh, you deal with the society around you. And these are core human values and will continue to be uh, in within the human domain. However, if you really see that these qualities um, are not really given their proper place in society and by the educational system. So there is a mismatch there because the kind of skill sets and qualities which AI will not be able to transplant so easily are the more softer ones, are the more sensitive ones. And those are exactly the ones which are, uh, which are not cultivated by the education system. Uh, the ones which are cultivated by the education system, however, are the ones which can get automated very fast. So therein, there's a huge dichotomy here. Why do we have a system of, ed of training, education, et cetera, which is geared towards uh, creating a mechanical output, wherein that itself, the, on the other hand, the same corporations are developing technologies to automate the same. There's, there's an underlying hypocrisy in the way uh, the, the, the whole edifice is working right now. So I believe that currently the rise of AI is driven, you know, by a singular motivation is corporate greed, fundamentally. This is my personal view. Uh, earlier revolutions of automobiles, of uh, television, of even the internet had an idealistic uh, underpinning behind them. So they were motivated by a greater good of either bringing about a revolution in the technology or in bringing about a revolution in human life, in social consciousness. There was a, it was much more of a philosophical underpinning behind those revolutions. This one, however, is driven mostly by negativity, and that's where the, I think the, the problem is coming about right now. In itself, it's a great transformation. There's no doubt about it. It is what it is, right? But the motivations that are driving it today in the world are not very pleasant. So, for example, let's look at driverless cars. Uh, driverless cars seems to be a great thing, but the problem is, of course, that you know, uh, more cars on the road lead to more congestion and more pollution, and that by itself is not getting solved simply by having driverless cars, you know. But you are going to, let's say, if you eliminate um, taxi drivers and bus drivers, et cetera, right, you end up creating, on the other hand, a vacuum uh, in the marketplace, a possible social problem as well. Uh, and you might argue that social problems can get, uh, can get eliminated through technology over a period of time, but when all of this happens at one time, what's the, what's the result? You know, it's, it's a very disturbing question. The second point is, you know, as you can see, the second picture is uh, a, a warehouse that is, uh, you know, that actually Amazon is conceiving in the future, a warehouse where there will be no human beings. It's completely going to be run by robots. And, um, uh, and while if you look at this kind of uh, landmass, the space which it occupies, it's huge. There's huge space that, that these warehouses occupy, completely run by robots. So if you can think about it, where uh, such a huge space exists within a geography, uh, a far-flung community, but doesn't give employment or create uh, any kind of connection with the local community. That's asking. That's a recipe for for disaster. That's waiting to to blow up. You know. Um, so as of now, the primary motive really for AI is the relentless quest for financial efficiency, essentially. And as you know, the the and that's. To be honest with you, it's, it's not a bad thing, of course. It's a, it's a very good thing to be financially continuously efficient. But what happens is that, that when there's a trade-off between the welfare of people and the well-being of people and innovation, then there is an issue because there becomes a schism that is created between the corporation and society. And that is something which um, needs to be bridged in the, in, the, in the future. So as of now, I believe, that because of all of this is one of the leading causes between the rising, behind the rising social tensions in the world that we see today is actually AI, believe it or not. Because uh, of the large scale automation that's going on, which is happening in the, uh, you know, more in an invisible manner, there is also a growing sense of joblessness, particularly in the first world countries, but in India as well and in emerging countries, we are feeling it as well in a big way. Joblessness is a huge problem. And the thing is that those kinds of jobs which were earlier, uh, let's call it this way, mass jobs, are no longer there, you know? They are getting automated. The, the politicians are, play, are, because they aren't able to really understand why this is happening and 
actually develop solutions for it, they are blaming China, they're blaming immigrants for, for this issue, you know, because those are easy identifiable scapegoats. But at the core of it, really, if you really see what happened to the US, for example, is why Trump got elected, essentially, is because of a large number, it's a huge amount of joblessness and also underemployment, not necessarily unemployment, but underemployment of a large section of people who did not have fulfilling jobs that, are, that uh, their predecessors or their forefathers had previously enjoyed. And instead of addressing this issue, uh, what is happening is, you know, because this is, of course, it requires many more complex solutions. These are not easy uh, questions to answer. It's easier to erect trade barriers. It's easier to erect, uh, you know, various kinds of um, uh, villains in the piece. Whereas actually you should be looking at AI and technology as a reason, as one of the root reasons why this is happening, is they are automating so much of the, of the back end, you know. It's leading to social polarization as a result because there are people who are, who are very, today, uh, who are plugged into this AI economy with advanced degrees uh, and university degrees and with qualifications, and they are obviously, um, they, are, they are extremely well paid and um, they are occupying most of the opportunities that are there, whereas a lot of people who are not plugged into this new economy of, uh, you know, uh, they, are, they are being left out, and that's causing tremendous social tensions, actually, particularly in the first world, but also uh, increasingly in our, in our society as well. And third, of course, is that because of, this, uh, of these social fractures, you're also seeing the rise of political authoritarianism around the world, where it doesn't, where uh, freedom, the concept of freedom seems to be temporarily under attack. So I believe that the, the way forward is that if you look at AI as a, a huge technological revolution of the next future, it needs to be created with the intention of enriching life, not destroying life, which was essentially a uh, altruistic motive, you might say, of previous technological innovations, and that altruism is missing today within this particular technological movement. And that's, the, that's at the root cause of what is causing these, uh, these schism. So what we have done is, as, um, as a founder of Mivero, uh, which is essentially uh, an AI-driven incubation platform which will enable the pursuit of passions, the way it works is essentially that as you know, that most people today are not able to follow their passions or what they really want to do in their life because of various barriers. So some of the barriers are lack of resources, lack of knowledge, lack of opportunities within their uh, environment, also because many of them have faced prevention in, uh, in, in the pursuit of their passion as well. Um, a lot of people give up as a result or they never really, uh, they never really follow it. They, essentially go with uh, what is readily available. So what Mivero is doing is Mivero is providing every user a five-step program of transformation, which will enable them to pursue their passion. And the five steps basically start from first beginning and learning how others have done it, how people have actually overcome their, their barriers and have actually pursued their passion. Then it helps people to identify the area of passion that they want to pursue. Third is they actually provide tools that will allow people to create and collaborate and to pursue that area of passion. Finally, they will look at also um, providing a marketplace where you can uh, monetize your talent and your creations. And finally, you can actually uh, even form a company and fund it. So this entire cycle of, of life, in a sense, of uh, beginning with trying to identify what you want to do in your life and ending with actually uh, realizing that, that dream is the entire process is being delivered through one technologically driven, uh, one technologic platform for the first time. Now, the way we have, we've actually thought about it is that one of the biggest gaps today in the world, why people are not able to do what they want to do is the lack of mentorship or counseling, proper, effective, you know. And uh, it is very difficult to find a reliable counselor in that sense. So the, the question that we had in mind is, can we develop counselling through AI, which has not happened before? And this is actually the first of its kind, is uh, in Mivero, there's an there's a application which we've developed called Veda. Veda, as coming from uh, our scriptures, is a life coach. 
And um, what Veda will do is Veda will, uh, will help you to identify what you really want to do in your life, your passion area. It will connect you. She will connect you with relevant collaborators and mentors who can help you take that passion forward. She will curate and recommend relevant content from different places. She will foster collaboration with groups. It will, she will also give you tips for successful uh, transactions in the marketplace. And she'll give you tips throughout the day to keep you motivated around the journey. Um, so essentially, that's what a life coach does. And what we believe is that, that uh, this kind of a life coach, for which uh, we have um, been issued a patent in the US, is really the way uh, AI should be used in the future. Because as you can see, there is a positive, a humanistic, and an enabling role which AI needs to play, and not an extracting role, not a deliberately um, destructive role, which currently it's playing now. This, I believe, is the future of AI, and it's the first of its kind, which uh, will come out in um, February of uh, 2019. So I do believe, just summing up then, I, uh, the real problem with the revolution of AI is the intent behind it. The intent needs to be, needs to be transformed, and for that, you know, companies uh, need to, and, and I would say entrepreneurs need to come up with, with humane uses of, of this technology, and not simply, helping, um, not simply helping in meeting conveniences or in, uh, in, um, uh, in fostering extraction of, of resources from the environment, but actually helping in nurturing a better and a more humane society. And that, I believe, is, is what will help humanity remain, uh, become not just not obsolete, obsolete, but actually will enable humanity to transform to another level. So, uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am uh, Dev Jyoti Guha from Skybox Security. You already have my introduction, right? So, I will be talking about how security is important. And security plays a vital role in mapping security with business. So, if we are streamlining security with business, everybody will see outcome and result. So, that is what Skybox is all about. We map vulnerabilities and security and threats as per your business context. So, what we are, so if you see, we are a Silicon Valley company, right? We were founded in the year 2002 by Mr. Gidi Cohen. And then we have $270 million funding in the last couple of years. And we are the fastest growing cybersecurity company today. We map the attack surface, as you can see, the attack surface management, threat context, along with your network model. That is what we are good at. And that is what we are doing. And that makes us different from others. So we have 700 plus active places we are working and we are present in 50 plus countries today. So as I said that we are the fastest growing cybersecurity company and we are doing security which others are not doing. As you can see these numbers, these are taken from Gartner report, from the Gartner Threat Insight. You can see that the 90 minutes is every time a new security vulnerability is coming up, right? 12,000 vulnerabilities are coming up every year. 50 to 300 out of those 12,000 are important for you. So all the vulnerabilities are actually not important for your business and for your network, but only 50 to 300 are something that you have to invest. The problem is not on the numbers that I talked about, but on the last two numbers, that 103 days is the average time actually to remediate a vulnerability. So it is taking 103 days by the organizations, by the IT to remediate the vulnerabilities. But if you see, the bad guys are only taking 15 days. So the bad guys are ahead of us in terms of exploiting a vulnerability. But we are not doing justice, and we are taking so much of time to patch a vulnerability, to remediate a vulnerability, right? So these are not numbers. This is an example that this really happened. How many of you know what is Equifax? Yes. So Equifax is just like Sybil in India. It is a credit bureau. It has, has all the sensitive information of the citizens. So in this hack, which happened in Equifax, 
144 million US citizens' data was compromised. Just imagine, 44% of the population, 144 million US citizens' data was compromised. What was the data? It was the social security numbers, just like our Aadhaar card number, right? Credit card numbers, bank account details, all these details were compromised. And why? Because of a single unpatched vulnerability of Apache Web Server. So that is why a single vulnerability can actually disrupt your organization, bring your moral down. And what was the consequences of this attack, the breach that happened in Equifax? Richard Smith was the CEO at that point of time, and that gentleman had to resign because of this particular breach. So this is the kind of consequences that a data breach is holding today in the modern day infrastructure. And these are not myth. There are a lot of stories that I can talk about. This is one of the examples that was one of the latest one. So why this happened? We need to understand the root cause. What is a technology failure? What is a people involved into that? Because cybersecurity is all about people, process, and technology. So the problem here was a process failure. It was a process failure. They had the vulnerability. They had the details. They scanned had shared the information. But still, they were not able to act on that. And because it was a process failure, that is why the CEO had to resign. Because whenever there is a process violation, the leader has to take the accountability. So these are the steps, or these are the process that one has to follow during, for a vulnerability management life cycle. And I will let you know at the end that how Skybox is helping you to create a process for your IT infrastructure in order to minimize the noise and help your IT to focus on the right set of vulnerabilities. So this is very important to understand the, how we are reducing the noise out of the alerts. There are so many alerts, there are so many vulnerabilities, but which is important to you? Which is important to your business? Each and every network is different. Each and every business is different. So we have to streamline the vulnerabilities according to your business and according to your network model, right? So there are more than 70,000 vulnerabilities that actually Skybox is collecting from scanners, from the NVD database, that is the National Vulnerability Database. They are all collecting these data, but again, out of which, out of which there are only few thousands, few thousands of vulnerabilities which are present in your infrastructure, which the Skybox security framework, or the policy framework I will call, it is a platform, very robust platform, and it can tie to any devices. More than 30 plus vendors can talk to Skybox. It is not a standalone solution, because security is all about connected architecture. Security cannot be a silo solution. So Skybox talks with more than 30 vendors. It takes feeds from any vulnerability management solution like Qualys, like your uh, Nessus. So these kind of solutions give feeds to Skybox, and the Skybox is able to give you the right vulnerabilities according to your infrastructure. Again, what we do is that we map, we do correlation on this vulnerability on the terms of CVSS score. You know what is CVSS score, right? Those are the top high, medium, severity, which is which the common vulnerability exploit score, we map them. After mapping the CVSS score to those vulnerabilities which we have gathered from the network scanners, from your IPS, from your firewalls, we talk to all these elements, more than 30 plus vendors. So then what we do is that we actually put threat intelligence on top of that. So we have a team of 40 plus researchers who are actually scanning the dark web, seeing that what kind of vulnerabilities are getting exploited by the ransomware, by the exploit kits, and the malware. So we inject those information to the framework, to the platform. And on top of that, what we do is that we do a context-centric prioritization. So we create a network model. So I have a very good example that how we are doing the context-centric prioritization. So we create a network model and with the help of network model, we map your business risks. That which, because I, as I said, that every network is different and every organization has different businesses. So we, we map those business risks with your vulnerabilities and we only give you those vulnerabilities where your IT team should focus on. So your IT team can focus on the right alerts, can, can actually quickly turn up, because the chances of survivability today is how fast you detect and how fast you respond. So I, I, I give a very good analogy that today the cybersecurity is just like a boxing match. Because you know that 
sometimes you may get fall down, but your chances of survivability is that how fast you stand in your feet and again start fighting. That is how cybersecurity industry is all about. Moving ahead from here, there are three pillars in which how we do the vulnerability prioritization. First is the threat centric, where we are actually putting the threat context, the intelligence, the dark web uh, messages. Like the, we have a database of more than seven lakh dark, dark web. And how, what kind of activity is going on onto those dark websites, we have an entire visibility onto that. So if there is a ransomware, because today you can buy an attack. So there are a lot of services that are offered in the dark web where you can buy an attack and you can launch an attack to an organization. Those are known as malware as a service. Ransomware as a service, you can buy an attack and you can launch a ransomware attack. So we keep an uh, eye on what kind of attacks are getting populated, what kind of vulnerabilities that the hackers are using. So we use those vulnerabilities in our platform to prioritize. Apart from that, we again map your network model with the attack vectors. And we give you a, a beautiful picture in terms of your business risks, according to your business, according to your network. And obviously, the vulnerability scores. So these three things are the pillars of Skybox prioritization. And they work in correlation with each other. This pyramid is the most important pyramid to understand how Skybox framework is able to help prioritize the right vulnerabilities and the right alerts for you. So if you see, the eminent threats are the direct exposed threat which the Skybox gives you and helps you to understand those. these are the threats which your IT should focus. So this is a graphical interface that will be available on the solution itself. And by just clicking on these areas into the pyramid, you can actually see that what are the threats that you should immediately act on and you should immediately react. So these are the di different things that we are doing into the pyramid. The first is the exposed, the most highly exposed threats. So this is again to your business. This is the threat context. As per your business, as per your network model, we give it. This is our USP. How, how important these threats are, because we map these threats to your IT, to your network, to your business, and tell them that this is going to affect the av availability of your IT. So some server is going to go down, which is a very critical asset for your business. A web server or a database server holding key customer information is a business critical asset for you. So if such kind of server, which is holding customer critical assets, and if that probably shuts down, your network is going for a toss and you, you are going to lose some money and business, obviously those are the vulnerabilities onto those assets are tagged as very high. And that is where you have to actually focus your alerts. Next is how we are taking the threat intelligence from the, from the industry. We are tying up with a lot of vendors like Qualys, like Rapid7, and we are tying to all those different types of vendors and we are ingesting those information into the Skywalk framework and onto the platform and we are leveraging those industry OEMs feeds in order to just enhance our own database and give you the right alerts so you don't have to have multiple consoles, multiple solution in your network, but it will be a single pane of glass or a single pane of solution from where you can manage and have a visibility onto your entire attack surface. Moving forward, this is how the context centric prioritization helps you. If you see this network, the Skybox solution actually helps you to do create a network model. So this is a network model. By tying with all your devices, all the third party devices, maybe, maybe it is a Cisco, maybe a FortiGate, maybe a Palo Alto, Checkpoint, we talk to each and every device of third party OEM. And we create this map onto the solution. Now, for example, as you can see in this particular diagram, that there are two servers which are highlighted. So one is a finance server and one is a development server. But when the Skybox does a network model and creates a network path, it sees that obviously one of the servers has an IPS. And I'm talking about a vulnerability, that memcache, which creates a DDoS attack. And the server goes for a shutdown. And it goes into a hang state. And it affects the availability of the security triad. Now, what we do is that we see that this path, one of the path is secured by an IPS. And just by enabling a signature onto IPS, you can protect that particular DDoS attack. But the other server, the R&D server over here, is open to attack. And that is a path, path that the attacker can take any time to actually create a DDoS, DDoS attack 
onto the particular server. So we will prioritize that asset and we will put that vulnerability on top of everybody for you so that your IT can focus on remediation onto that. So this is very important. So this network path, network model is different from every organization and we create a chart as per your network architecture and we help you to analyze this in a very better way. So obviously that is what it talks about, what I said, that IPS signature can be enabled and this recommendation is also given by Skybox. <clears throat> so as you can see that how we are detecting the alerts, we have data from 30 plus vendors as I said and also, also the vulnerability databases, we are taking feeds from that, we are talking to the we have more than seven, uh, dark websites, tie up with dark websites, we are monitoring the dark websites, nearly seven lakh, lakh those kind of websites which are there in the dark and where there are these kind of activities going on. So that is what, and we ingest this information to our platform to make the vulnerabilities, to make the alerts more meaningful to you and more meaningful to your business so that you can actually create and make value out of the system. And on top of that, we have a 40 people team, that is a Skybox research team, who are actually analyzing these alerts, removing the false alarms, removing the unwanted things, and, and actually putting the right things that are necessary for you. So seven lakhs sites on the dark web we analyzed, 25 plus security feeds. So this is how we are doing it by, we are exploiting the exploits in the wild, which are getting hacked, which are getting used, and which are getting exploited by the hackers. So there are three things which come up here. So the three most important things that I will write to bring here that what Skybox does is that providing a unparalleled visibility into your entire attack surface. That is one of the key things. Secondly, it helps in providing a good balance on man and machine. No solution, no solution can work automatically. It has to be driven by a person. It requires some skills, right? So no, it's not a robot. So we have created a workflow in which we have perfectly balanced the inputs that are required from the administrator and what Skybox can do in order to help you automate this entire activity, this vulnerability management lifecycle. So there are a lot of use cases that we do. We can actually help you in managing your security operations, managing your networks, managing your threats as well as vulnerability. So a lot of use cases can be derived from the entire Skybox framework and the platform that you can see over here. But again, mapping the attack surface, mapping technology to business, as well as creating the network model that I showed as per your environment and creating the right context and prioritizing the alerts is something that we help you to do. Visibility is the key to survivability, as you know. Secondly, obviously man and machine, and it's a single pane of glass which will give you the truth of your organization across all the IT assets. So it's a, a, a single pane of glass where truth can be seen, that what is important, what I need to focus, what I need to act on. Now, <clears throat> coming back to the Equifax breach, this is the process, right, as I showed. Now if you see why that happened, they had the information. That means the scanner was actually giving those information to the solution. But they were not able to assess, they were not able to prioritize as per their business. They missed the alert, the IT missed the alert. That is why the CIO Richard Smith, he had to resign. Because there was an alert, there was a vulnerability available, but the remediation activity was not done. How Skybox will help you in, to manage an entire vulnerability life cycle? So what we do is that, as I told, we map business to your vulnerabilities and also technology to your business according to your network context, according to your attack vector analysis. Also, it has an inbuilt incident management solution where vulnerabilities can be assigned to owners. And when a vulnerability is assigned to owners, you can give a time frame of a particular vulnerability. That for example, two days, three days. And if that vulnerability is not remediated within that time frame of two days, three days, the escalation can be automatically sent to the respective admins or to the respective owners whom you have designated. So it is not only seeing a vulnerability or assessing a vulnerability, but tracking the vulnerability for closure. That is very important. 
you have to see if the vulnerability is getting closed in time because timeline maintaining as you said see saw the the challenge was the timeline because it was 105 days and 15 days in order to reduce this 105 days we have to have an incident management solution within the vulnerability management solution and owners needs to be assigned there has to be ownership taken for the vulnerability and obviously that needs to be tracked for closures so that is what we are doing not only that we are helping you to give advice we are providing advices on mitigation for example if patching is not only the solution for a vulnerability there are a lot of things that can be done for example if i take a wannacry attack which utilizes the smb version 2 right whenever there is a vulnerability assigned there it actually takes minimum 72 hours for a patch to come in that time is known as the zero day time because there is a vulnerability announced but there is no patch available and that is a time when the vulnerability can be exploited by the hacker so what we can do we can give you remediation for example smb version 2 vulnerability that was a shadow broker vulnerability for for your uh, wanna cry you can immediately upgrade the protocol so that is something that skybox does there are a lot of work around solutions that can be done in order to minimize the zero day and in order to counteract how or enable our ips patch the ips comes up with virtual patching there are a lot of patching that the ips gives the rules the ips gives so just by enabling those ips rules you can shield that vulnerability temporarily until a patch is available so these are the kind of remediation and uh, and advisories that we give from the solution itself which helps your it not only to search to protect them from searching google and all those things it's a single pane of glass where you will get vulnerabilities you will get prioritization you, and you will get ticketing as well as remediation so that is what we are doing and this is how we are touching on the process and technology as i said cyber security is all about people process and technology you will see only technology but when you are able to fine tune a process a security process for a company or organization you are giving value so that is what skybox framework skybox is doing is that we are able to hit on the process and let me tell you this is not a solution just just like a firewall or a it is a business layer solution because it is mapping your threat context mapping your network model to your business risk and each and every business is different each and every network is different so each and every organizations will have different alerts different dashboards and different remediation actions remediation solutions from skybox so this is what we are doing the entire process how we are making it helpful for you so that you can protect yourself from breaches <clears throat> as i said single source of truth you can see that <clears throat> firewall ips waf edr antivirus solutions all of them talk to skybox platform it is a robust platform it is a flexible platform and it is an open platform security is all about being open that is how security should be security should not be closed it should be open it should talk to each and every elements in your infrastructure when a security solution talks to your infrastructure then only it can give you more value give you more context give you more prioritization and that is what skybox is doing And last but not the least, visibility. There are a lot of solutions, there are a lot of scanners, there are a lot of vulnerability management tool which only gives you visibility in terms of vulnerabilities. But we give you prioritization as per threat context, as per your business context, as well as remediation. And also we provide you a solution where you can actually track closures of vulnerabilities by assigning owners by creating an entire process for your organization from a single solution, from a single pane of glass, right? So that is how I how want, want to end it, is that it is, it is how about fast you react and fast you act and react and you take actions. That is how you can actually keep yourself safe because there is no silver bullet to security. Nobody can say that you are 100% secure. If somebody is doing that, let me be honest, that he's bluffing. Because there are two types of organization. One who know they are breached, and the second who don't know they are breached. So there is no third category. At the end of the day, everybody is breached. But it is how much visibility we have onto our organizations. 
and how we are mapping the business context as well as the threat context to our solution and to our network, because every network is different, will stand out, and that is how one can protect yourself. Because numbers say that 99% of attacks are because of known vulnerabilities. It is not because of unknown vulnerabilities. So thank you from my side. That's all. That is how I want to end my note. So um, I will be talking about hybrid multi-cloud, the new normal. Um, first, before I start, I just wanted to show of hands. Are most people here in the audience using some form of cloud or the other? Yeah. OK, great. And how many of you are using multi-clouds, more than one cloud? Yeah, it's quite a bit, right? So um, I, I did a similar session at, uh, you know, in Goa at Gartner and similar response. Many people who are deploying um, cloud computing solutions are actually deploying multiple clouds. And that's what this topic is all about today. And we'll, we'll go through the reason, what are some of the benefits of doing that, what are some of the pitfalls and challenges that one needs to look at, and what are some of the solutions that exist that one can leverage to, off, to, to deploy multiple clouds. So um, just a quick uh, set of uh, statistics. Uh, by 2020, 75%, according to Gartner, of organizations will have deployed a multi-cloud or a hybrid multi-cloud uh, model. Uh, the multi-cloud management market, so obviously if you're deploying multiple clouds, there, there is a need to manage those clouds. And that management market itself is growing at over around 31% uh, year on year. And uh, by 2020, 236 billion would be the estimated public cloud market alone. So these are just some numbers to put things in context. And uh, we spoke to some of our own CIOs, and these are some of the, just, I'll just put a, a, a give you some quotes that they, uh, they gave us, just to give you uh, uh, things in perspective. And, if, you know, basic, uh, basically, um, uh, you know, people want to deploy multiple clouds for several different reasons. It could be because they want to leverage the best in innovation from different cloud providers. It could be because of a merger and acquisition that happens, and the one company was using a particular cloud provider, and the new company is using a different cloud provider. It could be because um, uh, people use hybrid IT because they may, want, they may have some existing equi equipment either on-prem or in a data center, and they want to burst onto cloud. So different reasons that people give. But the, the, the amazing statistic, which I, which I will show you in a minute, is that almost 70, uh, you know, of the uh, multi-cloud users, of the uh, uh, cloud users, um, more than 50% are using multi-cloud, right? Uh, about over 10% are using single cloud, and only around 30 odd percent are not using. And of the cloud, uh, people who are using cloud, that works out to almost more than 75% using multiple clouds. So what are some of the multi-cloud benefits? And this is what I want to spend uh, some of the time. So obviously, one perceived benefit, although this, is, this works both ways, this also comes as one of the challenges, is uh, when you, uh, you know, most of the cloud providers' pricing is kind of standard, right? They don't do much negotiation. But uh, I think India being a very price-sensitive market, uh, there is a fair amount of negotiation that you can do between cloud providers when you pit one against the other. So obviously, if you deploy more than one cloud and you have more than one partner, then you know, they will try and give you the best uh, possible price. The flip side also is that you won't get bulk discount. If you, put all, if you put bulk of your infrastructure with one cloud provider, then you obviously will get a larger volume discount. So that, that works both ways. Uh, but you also have the access to required functionality. So every cloud provider is coming out with new and new innovations. Right? So AWS may have some innovations tomorrow, Azure may have something, Google may come out with something else, and some local pro partners will come out with something more customized to the local market. So everybody has some pluses and minuses, and, and it, you know, the rate of change of technology uh, in the cloud computing uh, world is so fast that if you're just tied to one player, that you may miss out on some of the new innovation that others might have. And therefore, you want to be able to have access to a breadth of uh, capabilities and innovation. Also, different cloud providers have their availability zones in different parts of the world. Even within India, there are different uh, cities where these uh, cloud providers are co-located. And so if you want to ag uh, have an access to a broader range of geographies, even from a re reliability redundancy perspective, you can do that uh, with using more than one cloud. 
Obviously, if you have more than one cloud, you don't have a vendor lock-in. So you're not, I mean, the, uh, all the uh, cloud providers that you're using know that you can, you already have another relationship and if they don't get their act together, you can switch to another uh, uh, provider. And obviously, there are different functions. It could be because of operating system. Somebody might prefer uh, Azure because they're using a lot of Microsoft in their environment and, um, you know, they get either because of cross-subsidy that Microsoft does with licensing that you do in your enterprise environment or because of things moving seamlessly. If you're using, for example, Azure Stack on-prem, then it's uh, pretty seamless to connect to uh, Azure on the cloud. So many, many reasons why people do hybrid and people do hybrid multi-cloud. What are some of the challenges, right, um, that um, uh, people have in uh, um, using multiple clouds? So the biggest challenge is in terms of skills, right? You have m each cloud is, you know, you, you really have to get certified experts in each uh, cloud. Everybody has their own nuances. They have their own way of, uh, uh, you know, managing their infrastructure. They, have, they may even have different tools to manage their infrastructure. And therefore, it's not easy to manage, uh, have skills to manage, you know, getting uh, uh, engineers in virtualization and cloud computing is, is a non-trivial task, right? They are in huge demand uh, by some of the cloud providers themselves. And so uh, how do you maintain and manage multiple skills across multiple clouds? You have to look at data integrity and consistency to be maintained across multiple clouds. You may get lesser volume discounts if you have mul multiple clouds. That's the point that I already touched upon. You have to ensure from a security perspective that you're not only securing one cloud, but you're securing all the components across multiple clouds, right? There's a regulatory compliance that you might have to go through for each cloud provider. And um, when you're troubleshooting issues, right? When, let's say there's a problem and you have to troubleshoot something, then that may take time and that may, you know, that may not be easy to do, especially if you have multiple clouds deployed. Uh, from an integration perspective, right, when you have you're trying to integrate maybe common dashboards. Uh, there, may be, uh, there will be challenges because now you have to do it not through one, just for one cloud provider, but across multiple clouds. So obviously it is a lot of, it is not, it's non-trivial to do the uh, to multi, uh, multiple clouds. Look at the infrastructure landscape that you have, right? You have various cloud providers, whether it's Azure, AWS, NetMagic, Google, DigitalOcean, Alibaba, and many more. There's IBM software. Um, there, there are a whole bunch of uh, software as a service applications. There's ServiceNow, there's Oracle, there's uh, Salesforce.com, there's so many others, right? And then you have different services that you want to consume, on, uh, uh, and uh, so different platform as a service as well. And how do you all make this work seamlessly, right? So that's a non-trivial thing again. So, um, so one, one of the things that we've attempted to do, and this is not, we are not, it's not only done by us, there are others also doing it, but we are probably one of the first guys to do it in India, is to come out with a, what we call as a cloud management platform. We're probably going to brand it as Solution Insight, um, but, but basically it gives you a common visualization across multiple uh, clouds that you consume, and it also does things like you know, optimization of infrastructure. So if you are using multiple clouds and you are wasting, say, virtual instances on a particular cloud, we, we have tools that can, you know, make sure that the right amount of uh, infrastructure is used. If, for example, you want to uh, track spends across multiple clouds, you can do that. So there's uh, governance as well as uh, monitoring and management of multiple workloads. And at the same time, you can also provision across multi-clouds, right? Now, one caution, right, uh, uh, you know, one caution, whether it's this solution or any other solution, each cloud provider is constantly innovating. So there is no one interface that will cover every single feature of all cloud providers. These common management platforms will make your life easier. So in terms of the challenges that I mentioned earlier, where you need a lot of skills, you need different tools, this will make 90% of your job much easier. But there will always be um, certain features that you want to leverage for which you need to go to the native interface of the cloud provider, right? So I'm not trying to say that this is one uh, solution that will just, you know, mysteriously fix everything. But this will just ease the way you can manage multiple clouds and just make multi-cloud management a lot more easier. Um, 
and there are, uh, you know, uh, so when you look at multi-cloud hybrid IT, right, the intent is that you, can pro uh, you have service providers today across the world who can co-locate your hardware, who can, uh, you know, provide you dedicated servers on OpEx, who can, uh, you know, provide you virtual private cloud where, 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 for example, compute may be dedicated and storage and network may be shared. They can provide you hosted private clouds. They can provide you uh, on-premise um, uh, private clouds, uh, as well as various public clouds, right? So whether it's Google, Amazon, Azure. But the beauty is that how do you manage across all of this, right? How do you, how do you, uh, you know, when you have different workloads spread across multiple uh, platforms, how, how do you manage this? So there should be a single dashboard that can at least give you a visibility at the very least if not the ability to, uh, you know, uh, provision and uh, start and stop instances, but at least give you a single dashboard for governance, right? But of course, there are more and more providers like us who are looking at providing a lot more functionality uh, to do this. And this will help uh, people deploy, go through the multi-cloud journey. And um, basically, um, uh, you know, when you, how do you decide which cloud is best for what application? So we recommend the solutioning approach, right? So the, the, you, basically with the solution, uh, you know, the provider should have a consulting team that will probably, will, will go through your requirements, go through the different applications you want to deploy, figure out which is the best cloud for the, I'm not recommending by any stretch of imagination splitting one application across multiple clouds. Uh, I would also recommend have one or two large partners so that you can you know, derive more attention and get better uh, volume discounts. But at the same time, which is the best for what particular service that you're looking to deploy, right? So, so there needs to be a consultative approach. Uh, there needs to be a design done based on what is uh, the requirement. Then there's a build and migrating, migration phase and then a run and optimization phase. The optimization is very, very important. People often neglect that. So uh, what happens is you end up deploying a cloud and then you suddenly find that after some time, the, you know, that there's a lot of wastage happening of instances. Somebody's forgotten that he's turned on so many virtual machines. So a tool that can constantly, uh, w uh, you know, look at optimization and also uh, a tool that can actually, you know, compare um, the costs across multiple cloud providers so that if, if it doesn't matter, then you choose the one that is the most cost effective. Uh, and of course, you have to do uh, compliance across all of this. So that's what we recommend for... Um, when you're selecting uh, the, uh, not only a cloud provider, but entire, your entire multi-cloud hybrid architecture. So um, I, may I request that the video be played? I just have a quick video to show you what some of the things that we're doing. I think the sound is not there. Actually, uh, uh, you know, thing in production, which is already running across the world, and this is a screenshot that we've taken from that. platform that covers multiple clouds as well as uh, bare metal and virtual private clouds. So it's basically, it co covers the entire gamut of hybrid multi-cloud and monitoring and management through a single platform. Manages your uh, firewalls and load balances as well and compute and storage across multiple platforms.
compliance check is also included in this. And this is the trusted fixer which reviews configurations for leakages. That's why you, how you optimize your infrastructure. So all of that is included in this. So this is the level at which people are already providing services. I've just taken an example of our solution, but we are not the only ones doing this. There are others doing this across the world. So that's the, you know, and I, I'm sure as, you know, uh, technology evolves, there will be more sophisticated uh, platforms that are available to, um, to make the management of multiple clouds easier. So uh, if you look at uh, what are the benefits of having a common view, right, when it comes to multi-cloud. So one is you get asset visibility across projects. So a single dashboard which gives you visibility of where your assets are. Provisioning and managing of workloads, again, through a single pane of glass, right? Again, as I said, I want one caveat here. This is not 100% functionality because at any given time, an Azure or AWS or any other cloud provider will be constantly coming out with new features. And any uh, cross-cloud management will always be, uh, you know, a little bit behind to, uh, before all the features are available on the common portal. But having said that, 90% of the work that people need to do to make management easy, which is starting and start stopping your infrastructure, uh, you know, looking at the utilizations, uh, looking at your tracking your spends, all of that will be will be seamless with with these kind of uh, single view benefits. You look at various performance dashboards, right? You can optimize, as with the trusted fixer that you just saw on the video can help you optimize infrastructure spends and right size your workloads. So those are the various benefits of having a single view. So I'll just like to sum up uh, on the benefits uh, on how one should go about this. One is to maximize innovation, and you, I would still recommend, despite all the challenges that I uh, mentioned about whether it was compliance, whether it was regulatory, whether it was security, uh, management, I would still recommend looking at a long-term multi-cloud strategy because the fact of the matter is that each cloud provider is innovating and you want to leverage the innovation that you don't want to get stuck with a provider that cannot innovate beyond a certain uh, point because one doesn't know who will come out with the next major innovation, right? So at least the key, uh, two, a couple of key players, I would certainly recommend looking at multiple clouds. Uh, we will definitely recommend a common governance framework at the very minimal for managing a multi-cloud framework. And obviously, one needs to balance the complexity uh, of, uh, and challenges of multi-cloud that I enumerated with also its benefits. So don't blindly adopt multi-cloud. Please understand what are, is your organization geared to, ma or does it have the skills to manage multiple clouds? Do you have the right service provider who can do this for you? Uh, and, and only then adopt on this journey. But in the long run, definitely try uh, you know, this, I would still recommend this as a long-term strategy. Uh, obviously, it depends on the maturity of the organization before they can adopt the strategy. So that is, um, I would also like to say that, you know, a lot of this uh, that I spoke about, I didn't possibly reference each slide, but there's, you know, I've, I've re uh, you know, taken a lot of this from interaction with Gartner, looking at reading some of the reports, uh, 451 research, and markets and markets. But coupled with the experience that we've actually seen over the past few years, so taking the relevant stuff, which I believe is relevant for India. When, when you look at some of these global reports, there are a lot of things that they talk about which may not be relevant to India. So we've taken, I've, I've just focused on what is relevant to India. And uh, so that is what I had for this topic. I'd love to answer any questions that you may have.